All right, so the first thing we're talking about tonight is how to write a TV show. And mainly we're just talking about the differences between writing for TV compared to writing for film, since we already kind of went over it. They have a lot of similarities, but there are some differences depending on what kind of TV you are writing. With TV, you also have to look at how this story can develop and continue. With films, you can leave a sort of cliffhanger in them if you're trying to make a sequel, but for the most part, films are pretty self-contained. They're like one story and you wrap it up at the end and it's done. With shows, you want there to be a buildup, something that leads into the next episode and the next season and multiple seasons long story that you can keep it going unless you have a limited series or a mini series where you have a kind of like an expanded film. But if you're just writing a, a show that you, you're not really sure when the last season is, um, then you, which is most shows, then uh, you wanna make sure that you can keep it going until uh, you get to a certain point where you decide to end it. Some TV show seasons are self-contained, but even then they have a longer time to get from point A to point B. So it's a lot, it's like eight to 10 hours or more compared to a two hour, three hour film. So if you're trying to have a one self-contained story, kind of like Stranger Things season one, it's kind of self-contained, but it spreads out amongst many episodes, making it like three, three to four movie lengths long. So you have to have more in there for people to enjoy and keep coming back to. It also, I feel like, depends on the genre that you're working on because some genres can get away with being more like an overarching narrative or storyline of the season and little things um, that are hinting at it here and there and it doesn't have to constant be the main thing you focus on every single episode it can be just like a little bit here a little bit there and mm -hmm. you can flesh out the characters more or go into different things and different storylines in inter in between or interwoven in it but if it's like a drama or or something a little more like that you would have to have at least something to keep the um, attention of the audience a little bit more like something a little more um, a, a storyline that's a little more substantive that has a little more substance that can carry the story a little bit more depending on your genre or depending on what you're going for yeah I think it really depends even if you have like comedy there's different types and like you have you know even if we're going for a sitcom like Friends or How I Met Your Mother it's building towards something whereas if you're talking about something that's a little more episodic where it's just kind of one off then that's more yeah you could write like a short little story and have it be um a lot more episodic not really connected in too much of a way but even then I'd say sitcoms they often have like little things like you said here and there where they they bring in a new character that they might bring back later or they talk about somebody's family member or something that that's going to lead up to something later on so they drop these little backstory hints to everything's very intentional even if it's just for the sake of a joke it still has an intention um and also you also have to think about yeah even stories that are more character based yes um the conversations and the characters can hold a lot of the show like in a show like friends the first season relied a lot on them just chatting but it had to have storylines it had to have something that they were going through or that was happening that tied everything together like in the first season it was Rachel adulting and becoming a more independent person while Ross was dealing with his divorce and you know even though it was a sitcom and it was mainly focused on them and the friendship and the chat and most season one episodes just started with them talking about random stuff sitting down in a coffee shop it still had an overarching narrative and storyline that the characters were going through even if it was just developmental you know just they're growing in their in their personal lives or in their personal journeys yeah when you yeah. said uh when you said rachel's adulting i heard adultering oh. <laughs> <was> like, <"What?" laughs> <laughs> but yeah um yeah i say characters are important both in films and tv but even more so in tv if you have a if you don't have strong characters that keep people coming back to watch them uh, whether the premise of the show is amazing or not, you're going to have a hard time maintaining an audience. Whereas a film, 
sometimes it can go off of the plot or the premise the surroundings not so much the characters people might like the concept or just what is happening in the story and the character might not have too much going on but in a tv show it's it's very dependent on the characters because we're with them for so long that um we start to grow more attached to them if they are good and written well and that is why you have to have strong characters that um keep people coming back in a tv show and it's a lot more character reliant and a lot of there's, different. There's also the fact that with a TV show, you're talking about multiple seasons or multiple episodes, which means you can't just have one storyline and have it keep someone's attention. Like one of the reasons, I don't know where it is now, maybe it got better. But one of the reasons me and Coda stopped watching shows like A Million Little Things or even This Is Us, to a lesser extent, it took us longer, was because it was constantly like drama, 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 especially a million little things. The first few episodes, it kept building to a bunch of different new dramas and there was no payoff. It was just, here's a new thing thrown at the wall. Here's a new thing. Here's a new thing. Here's a new thing. And at some point it either felt forced or it didn't keep our attention long enough for us to continue watching. So you can't just rely on this storyline or this arc to keep your like alone to keep your viewers attention you need to add you need to combine that with characters that they will care about characters that they like or they relate to or they care for in some way or find interesting in some way well here's the thing million little things is still going so obviously no i know it's still going but i'm just i'm using it as an example of why i personally give up on it and I know that a lot of Riverdale is freaking still going. And th- like that's just because it's going is not proof that it's a good show. Um, Riverdale is another example. A lot of people stopped watching that. But here's the thing. Three. Something's working for it, right? And the thing is- Characters, mainly, probably. Characters, right. Yeah. And the characters, people want to see what's happening to these characters. A million little things. I only, they want I to see what happens with the guy and the girl that has cancer and what's going to happen. Is she going to choose to not do the the- um treatment or not like what is going to happen there and then what's going to happen with the guy one, that so, like, almost did suicide spoilers. and who's gonna what's gonna be happen dead there? for all we know by now go ahead what no i was gonna say this is season one so no spoiler she might be dead for all we know by now this was episode one anyway there's a, like there's different things happening with the characters so you want to see what's going to happen and that's why i believe this show is continuing on is because it has strong characters that people want to keep coming back to it's not for everybody obviously because me and priscilla stopped watching it but i don't think using a show that's still going is a good example of showing what bad writing for tv honestly i think so because there's a lot of shows that are still going just because of networks and just because, because they have of... an audience if they lost their audience they wouldn't have... no no i know shows that their audience is getting lower and lower smaller and smaller by the season and they're still going because a bunch of money is being pumped into them because so... they have money coming in for it they have to have an audience or if their show doesn't have an audience really it gets canceled it. honey stop if it, honey if show i'm just have... saying okay fine if Whatever. a show I... doesn't have an audience it gets canceled that's just what happens. Yeah. That's well, why shows that, are all about ratings. They're all about things. Sometimes all Netflix, Netflix will cancel shows. Sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, tell that to all the Netflix shows that got canceled after one season, even though having a huge audience, but they, oh, it wasn't what we expected it to be. Meanwhile, you have a bunch of shows that are garbage that are getting less and less people by the season, but they're still for some reason surviving, even though everyone is giving up on it. Like more because and more Netflix people has a different model. Season. Netflix has a different model. They're not caring about as many people. They're caring about people subscribing. So if they get new subscribers for it, then they might keep right. the show Well, going. I'm just using it as an example. I'm not saying like, okay, it's not a perfect example because fine, it's still on the air. But what my whole point is just that you can't rely on one thing alone. With TV shows, it needs to be both. The reason A Million Little Things is probably still a thing is because they care about the characters. They are probably compelling. You have Which is to why have this both. show is doing something right. My whole argument no. on this is just I don't want to say that this show is doing it wrong because it's still going. So obviously, I'm not saying that it's it doing right. it wrong. I'm saying yes, this is are. why I personally <laughs> let, stopped watching it. And then I used it as an example as to what I think is a good balance, in my opinion. Maybe I should have made that more clear. In my opinion, I think that a good balance is 
storyline and characters. You can't just rely on a storyline to hold your entire show together and not develop the characters enough because then people stop watching, people get bored, people don't care anymore. Same thing with characters. You can't, you can have cool characters and yes, it's heavier. For a TV show, characters and crappy storylines, it's easier for them to ignore the crappy storylines if they really like the characters. But if you want new people coming in and people continuing to be engaged and watching, it is good to also develop the storyline as well as the characters. I'm just saying that, I, in my opinion, I believe that a TV show needs to find a good balance between the two because it can end up losing the viewer's interest or just become stagnant at a certain point if it just focuses on one. Gotcha. Yeah, so the whole point is characters are super important in TV. <laughs> That's what we were saying. Um, yeah. And that's why, you know, even though you might have a show that, and show obviously, like, not everyone's going to like a show, no matter how good it is. Not everybody liked Game of Thrones. Not everybody liked Friends. No matter how popular the show is, there's going to be people who don't like it. But the ones that are more popular, the ones that are still going, the ones that get continued, continuously renewed for new seasons, they, they're doing something right to attract the audience back, to have the network want to do another season. And they do not care about anything other than the financials, the networks. The networks only care about the financials at the end of the day. And so if it's bringing in whatever their metric is for, for you know, Netflix might be to bring in subscribers or new subscribers or to maintain a subscriber count, whereas broadcast and Cable is more about views and how many people are watching it because of ads. And so whatever their metric is, whatever network is producing this show, they are going to look at their specific metric and see, is this show looking promising? Does it look like it's going to be able to do this again next season? Is it losing a huge count of subscribers? Is it losing a bunch of viewers? Then they might cancel the show because it's not doing it. It's not worth it to the network or if someone just comes being, in they don't see like, the projection of it being worth the cost that they're putting into it for another season because seasons are very expensive they can be some shows are like 10 million in that, an episode and so it could be like a hundred million dollars for another season and if they don't if someone, see the numbers and they don't see the revenue potential for it to keep it going they will most likely cancel it go ahead i would say or if someone just comes in with a huge wad of cash and I'll be like, I'll pay you this much to keep it one more season. Because I am convinced that that must be, there's just so many shows lately that are just so trash and they're still on TV. And I know so many people that say it's garbage or don't watch it anymore or stop watching. So something has got to be that there must be someone with a lot of money investing in these shows and investing for them to stay on for at least a few more seasons. I think, but that's just my opinion. I disagree. I don't think anyone's going to put in a bunch of money to a show that's not going to give them any return mm. unless they really care about the story. They don't care. Exactly. About... That's what I'm saying. Or, they all right. or, you know. All right. Well, that's all speculation. Let's get back to like, exactly. Actual... I'm just giving my little conspiracy theory. That's all. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. This is from Film Courage. This is letter E in the syllabus. Nine questions television writers must answer when developing a television show by Peter Russell. What world is the show based in? The Battlestar and Caprica and Battlestar Galactica. So the main worlds of that show are on the ship with all the people and the, and the home world of those humans where they came from. Uh, is, it in a, your, is your world an apartment or a coffee shop in a little small area of New York City, like in Friends? That's their world. You know, they, they live in this little neighborhood. A world can be multiverses or it can be as small as a workplace or home. Don't be generic with the world, be specific with it. Then what is the overarching theme? What do you wanna say with this story? What's the message? What's the overall message that's shown either throughout the entire season series or keeps coming back up in each episode? 
what is this show like? What other series has it gotten inspiration from? And he says, you know, don't be afraid. Like a lot of writers try to say, oh no, my show's different. There's no other show like it, but everything should be somewhat like something else because you can draw inspiration from other things. All the biggest movies, all the biggest shows, plays, a lot of things have gotten inspiration from either historical stories or other pieces of art or work that have come before them, books, things like that. So what is your show like? What other series can it be shown to be like, have similarities to? Because that's also good when you're trying to pitch a show is saying, yeah, this is kind of like a mixture between this show and this show, or this is kind of like friends if they were all cyborgs you know whatever your show is it's going to be like that sounds something. interesting <laughs> right and that might interest people like oh we've never heard that combination before let's see what this is like so showing that it's like something else but but also has its own uniqueness to it is a very well, important I think, you know I want to come to like, can i interject you yeah go ahead so when i think it's being like something else it's like when it comes to aesthetic and when it comes to beats in how a story is formed and flowed, and when it comes to genre, it needs to be within the same realm. When it comes to actual story idea or details, it can be very different. If you yeah. have all of those other things that are in line at the same power for power for the network that you're um, creating for, then um, it doesn't matter uh, if the story is very different is like because if those other things match like then it will still flow like as long as the genre fits like you know what i mean like you can come up with a very interesting romantic movie that has the same type of like budget aesthetic um plot points like turning points you know when you build a story like you know how music they all have the same framework it's the same, same thing beast, as as yeah. you, can, you can make all the details different you can make the story completely different and it should still fit because those other big the big like um, colored details are the same way. Right, and yeah, exactly. So it can be, you can have it be like, I'm gonna say How I Met Your Mother. It's very much like Friends, except for that it is about um, some guy telling a story to his kids about how he met their mother and showing how everything leads to this one destination. And Friends, even though they are similar in ways and setup and story, like how they structure it. And obviously they're both in New York City, and they're both sitcoms, so they're very similar in those aspects. But then it's about, you know, the friends, they don't really have, they don't know what their destiny is. They don't know really what they want to do yet. And and uh, How I Met Your Mother, he knows what he wants. He wants to be married, have a family, be an architect, whatever. So like you said, you can have similarities in setting and similarities in, in kind of the world. And it's similar in, in structure, but the story, like what actually happens episode per episode is can be very different, but you can still say like when you're pitching a show kind of like that, you can be like, yeah, it's kind of like friends, but this and that. And here's why it's different. So you always want to set yourself apart as well, but. Definitely be like the structure is similar. Right, so exactly. Or the comedic timing is similar or something like that, where then it's like you're being very specific on, you know, certain points of, you know, structures the same for, and then, but it's still a unique story with your own characters. So yeah, kind of interesting, all these things. It's like having animation, like those different types of like animation that you could do. So you can be like, it's more like this type of animation or that type. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah, and there's so many different kinds you can do and so many Very structures you can do with it as well. But I feel um, like that would be a, a huge challenge to like actually like to be a writer of like a series series. Like, I wonder how long that takes to actually like create and if they start like building, um, some of the episodes before the entire thing's written or do they write it all out and have like six seasons written? I think um, it's uh, it's different from show to show, but typically they have, somebody's gonna write the pilot episode and they're gonna kind of set the groundwork for the show and they might write more episodes than that or they might get a team of writers where everyone kind of uh, comes together for the show once it's screenlit to start production and they'll start writing out the episodes after that. They have the ideas, the outlines, but they don't typically write out the entire thing um, before they, before they begin shooting. They, yeah. What they might or not do before sometimes. they begin shooting, but before they begin actually pre-production. 
what they might do sometimes is they'll have like like Coda said an outline of where they would like it to end or how they would like it to end or the arc that they're thinking of having um and then they will go from there and okay how do we get from point a to point b and how do we make this work or they will have like one one aspect of it fully planned out and then the rest will just go as it goes like Futurama they had some aspects already planned out and they hinted at in episode one um How I Met Your Mother had the ending planned out and recorded by end of season two I believe season two or season three um uh, Supernatural was supposed to be a five season arc and it that's why it's supposed to end in season five but then it got greenlit for like 10 more years so it they had to like come up with something else but there are a lot of shows that will have um an idea of where they want to go or they will have oh this is what I would like to happen or this is where I imagine it going but a lot of creators have talked about how they try to not have the idea of the ending too set in stone because these characters evolve with them sometimes. Like as they write them, they become their own people. They, the actors make them their own. So th they change a lot of, from the idea of the writer's mind to the real, like the character that the actor is playing that is on TV, that is finally being written. Like it's a lot, it's a, it's a big step from A to B. So mm -hmm. It, it really does go through a transformation and you see that. And so you, you try to give it some freedom to, okay, let's see where this character's story takes them or where I wanna, I wanna go with it. This is the basic of their personality, their character, and let's watch them grow and see what happens from there, depending um, on the story. Yeah, there's a lot that goes into it. Like, yeah, and yeah, it'd be cool. Like if you wrote a pilot and have a green light, that would be awesome. Cause then you would just like, Keep going. Yeah, because then the network takes over and helps you create it. So it's really cool. <laughs> um, the next question that the um, Peter Russell asks is, uh, if you're trying to make a show, what is the character's main struggle? So every character should have some kind of struggle, something they're trying to overcome. It might not be explicitly stated, but it's in the background. So like in Game of Thrones, some characters struggled with trying to prove themselves. Am I good enough? That was kind of their question throughout the series. And they might not have like literally said that, but you could tell that they just wanted to prove that they were capable and prove that they could do what others said they couldn't. And so that was their struggle throughout the series. And um, another might be, do I have to give up my morals in it to enable to uh, obtain power? You know, that could be Daenerys's question. Does she have to stop trying to be as good as she, you know does she have to give up her morals so that she can obtain power because it, is she going to be able to get power by being altruistic you know and so like uh all the characters in these shows will have some kind of struggle will i ever meet the person that i want to meet will i um am i good enough for somebody else am i capable of taking care of my family how do I do that you know something will be in the back of your character's mind throughout the entire series that drives them forward throughout the series for sure yeah and then the other thing like you know when it starts working on a series and stuff too it's interesting to take the idea and like actually like elongate it and actually play it out long term it's mm -hmm. challenging and very cool to do yeah and you're gonna so every character will have a deep core wounds. You need to solve as you go through, and it's interesting. Even if you work with like bigger studios and things, there's still gonna be things that come up and figure out how to move through that. It's cool. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, it's a. They I, the the way I've heard it is like networks tend to let the creators, if the creators are doing well, they kind of just let them do it for the most part, unless they're like stepping over what the network has in mind of what they're. Uh, brand is but typically they kind of just go if it's doing well go ahead and do what you want because you you obviously know what you're doing it's doing well so it just depends from network to network but that's that's typically how it can go but yeah so each character will have either like deep core wounds or a trauma 
um, that they're trying to get over or trying to live through. Maybe the dad's daughter died and he's trying to get over it throughout the series, or maybe their parents died or, you know, anybody, anything, something in their past. That's not death. <laughs> the way they were raised. I already said a bunch that went death. <laughs> But the way they were raised, the way they were examples. raised, what they're trying to come over either within themselves or something they're trying to get over that they've gone through in the past uh, will be something that is in their character throughout the series. Mm -hmm. This next up comes from Tyler Mowry. And it's uh, letter F in the syllabus, building a TV series, episode four, how to structure a TV series. Structure in TV is unique from film in that you need to think of seasonal structure as well as each individual episode structure. Some shows or miniseries or limited series and therefore typically know how many seasons there will be in total. So they also consider the series structure. So they consider like the, the overall series and its structure, how it's gonna play out, kind of its arc. And then the seasonal structure, what's going to happen in each season and its arc, and then each episode's structure and, and its arc. So you have to be thinking of all of those things when it comes to TV, whereas film, you just have to think of the one main arc going over the, the, the film as a whole. Yeah, and it's, it's and yeah, and with series, like every single episode has to have like the beginning, middle, and end points too. So it's, in, but it also has to tie together in like bigger middle. So if I had like say 12 episodes and I was just doing like one season, how I would initially think about how to break this down is like you have 12 episodes, so it would be like the first couple, like two episodes are like the opening. Like the first one is obviously a scene establisher. Um, and then the second one's gonna tie into like how this, um, what's gonna be the groundwork of the rest of the series. And then you have all of the things, you know, maybe something happens and you have a turning point at, you know, a big turning point at season four, but you have turning points in every single episode. And then you kind of do that, like a big one, like maybe a couple episodes later and like, and then maybe off put it, maybe a huge one at nine. And then, and then you have like how the series like leads up to the grand finale ending. Or something like that um i'm not sure like you would probably play around a little bit too like you might want to like slightly alter big turning points um and different stages in a tv series because then it will make it always interesting too that's something i think about like if you have one series and you have like a huge like turning point you know on season like on episode five you might do another series where the turning point comes in really early on on episode three and it's like structured slightly different but still within you know, a realm of a beginning, middle, and end, I guess, if that makes any sense. Yeah, yeah, exactly. From what I know little of, like, tiny structure. story arcs, and then the bigger story yeah. arc for the season, and then the overall story arc for the series. Exactly, yeah. So, and then that's kind of interesting. And then you could start to play on, like, how, like, things tie together, new, um, subtle nuances. So, you write it all out, and then I would, what I would do is, like, take the 12 um episodes and then go back over once you've like written everything and kind of like start to add in more subtleties so once you have 12 episodes then you can go to the top and be like wow we have all of this information let's add some subtleties into like episode one that kind of like secretly tie into something later and you can do weird things like that how they do in big movies um and i find that that's very interesting i would like do that as like uh when you do like the fine tooth over that's how I would do it. I mean, people would probably do it differently, but I would write like the main story structure first, like the bare bones, and then you just add to it. Be like, mm -hmm. okay, so we have like, uh, how do we get to point A to point B to point A to point B, but it's kind of boring. So let's actually like move it around a little bit here. And then, you know, make, yeah, you know, if that makes any sense or like add some nuances here. Um, yeah, I think it really depends on the, it depends on the show and, and like, okay, so an independent, writer can write out the whole series if they want um but typically speaking if you are getting a show on a network yeah. you are going to have a team of writers or you're going to have at least one or two other writers with you so um typically what happens in a in a tv show when it's when it's a network one if you haven't written out the episodes beforehand you usually have the outline like you said like the main story and then um they do like um they figure out what the episode's going to be about, what could happen in that episode, what could happen in future episodes in the season. And they do what's called breaking the story, break story, where they break it down into little pieces. And then they have either a um, staff writer or an assistant writer or somebody 
whoever, however many they have, um, write out the actual outline of the episode, how it happens in order based on that meeting that they had, that brainstorming session that the group of writers did. And then a staff writer will be assigned the episode to write it all the way out. So it is a lot about talking about it and figuring it out beforehand, but it is a group setting. So there, there, it will definitely be different from TV show to TV show because there'll be more minds in it and different minds in it, each show you do. So even if you have the same lead writer, all the rest of the minds are gonna be different or could be different. And so then the show might turn out completely different than another show that lead writer was on just because there's other people putting their their voices and their artistic yeah. creative vision into it. I feel like that would be very cool too, like actually too, like when you do it with the with the teams too. But I, I'm not sure I like the like some people do like fly by the seat of your pants where you can kind of like, you know, have like one episode of a pilot and you kind of like write it like an episode above. I mean, that's one way to do it. But I would say, I would probably say like, you at least write like an entire series before you even, you know, so you know how like, I, I guess, if that makes any sense like I feel like that yeah it makes sense it's just that it, de it depends uh it would take a lot of time it. to do and I've heard of people doing it it just depends on you know what each person wants to do and so I was just meaning like if you haven't already written the episodes and even if you already have like you said they usually if you do get it into a network they'll they'll go back in and make sure you know everything's good and everything makes sense or hopefully they will anyway and then um do some little rewrites here and there like you said to, to add in some subtleties if you didn't know what the ending was when you were writing episode one then you can go back and add in those little things or they can have somebody assigned to it to do that um and so it just depends from series to series and each individual showrunner will decide how they want to do it some showrunners yeah. like you said they write the whole thing themselves uh game of thrones guys they did it for the first I think they did it for a while, like the first few seasons, maybe the whole show, but I'm not entirely sure. Well, because sometimes you get into a flow, right? And like, it's risky to like start building stuff before like you have like the story written because like, if there's a major change or something that needs to happen or people change their mind, it could be huge or like it doesn't follow the book. There's so many more things that go into. Um, so again, it makes more sense that they might start being more seed of the fly later on because you already have a feel for the series. The flow is already there. Like if you had, you know, written a whole series, Game of Thrones, and then they filmed it. And then as they were filming the, the first season, it's doing so well, they start writing a second season uh, and so forth so that it could stay ahead of the curve. Then eventually like the consumers are going to be watching faster. So then the, the writers are working harder and harder to stay above the <laughs> curve ball, I'm, I'm guessing. Right. Uh, well, it still has to be shot and produced and everything, so it but typically I mean, follows like, to like the the yearly yeah. release season for the but most part. I mean, part. like after a while, it starts to like flow itself. If that makes any sense, like that would make more. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, yeah. like after you get the beginning down and you have the outline, it, it becomes easier and easier to fill in the blanks, like you're saying. Yeah, because the character's already established. Now it's just about like making choices or turning points or making things happen versus. Right yeah all right so um back to letter f to tyler mowry he says in a tv series a pilot is often featuring a person entering a new situation so i'm going to go back to friends again and friends rachel leaves her fiance at the altar and enters a new situation where she's with the rest of her friends she's trying to move in with monica ross had just broken up uh, his his marriage has just fallen apart, so he's in a new situation of being single. Monica enters a new situation of having an old friend become her roommate. So all of them are in new situations in that first episode. In Breaking Bad, Walter White enters a new situation, and now he has cancer. And so he begins making drugs and trying to be a dealer. And how is that going to go? So usually what a pilot in a TV show will do is set up a... They'll take a character and they'll put them in a new situation and we get to see how is that going to turn out for the rest of the series. Sometimes um, it's a group of people. Sometimes it's just one character, but all the other characters end up having a ripple effect by that one character's reaction. And it, it ends up affecting all of their lives. So it, it doesn't always have to be every single character in the show going through something, but it, as long as it affects every character in some way, the things going on. 
Yeah, or it, or it say, introduces the character's situations into the story. Right. And say. so I would even say that sometimes that's um, not always the case because sometimes a pilot episode can also throw us into the middle of a situation or the dynamic. Um, so I would say that is mostly the case, like where you are seeing characters have some kind of new situation and they're, we're seeing how that works out, whether it's a comedy, sitcom, drama, hour long, half hour long show, whatever it is, that typically is the way the pilot does it. Um, but there are shows that kind of just throw us in the middle of a, dyna a dynamic of characters that are already, already there, they're already doing stuff um, and nothing really like brand new for them is happening. We just kind of see how that relationship goes. Um, but it depends on what the show is, of course. Yeah, sometimes they will just introduce one more character. Um, like, I, I remember in How I Met Your Mother, the first episode a lot was normal, like their everyday whatever. They're playing Have You Met Ted. And then they introduce Robin. And it's the way that they show like his infatuation with her, it kind of seems like it's not the first time that Ted's been through this. So even for even in that scenario, it's like, okay, this seems interesting and new to us, but for them, it's not. It's just a regu regular thing. We're just being put into it. Or even in examples of shows where nothing happens, where it's just, oh, these are their lives. They're just showing us the dynamic of this situation. Like it's nothing special happening with them, but we're just glimpsing into and getting to know these people's lives, their dynamic how they react um, and how they interact with each other and stuff like that. So sometimes it, it doesn't always have to be like a catalyst for the season. Sometimes it's just throwing us into it and giving us a little bit of context into who these characters are and what the dynamic is. Yeah. And there are different story structures people use for writing scripts, especially with TV. Um, you got like three act structures where you have the first act is the setup. It's the introduction. It's telling us about the world, about the characters, about whatever's happening. And this can be per episode. It can be, obviously it has to be for the pilot episode. Um, and it can be for a season. A season can have a three act, five act, six act structure, depending on how they want to do it. Um, where it's always going to have a beginning, middle and end, but how they break that up is going to determine how their story structure is. So a three act structure, they do act one is the setup. It's telling us about the world and the characters. Act two is the confrontation, rising action. Um, they're getting ready to do whatever they've set out to do. And act three is the, um, what do you call it? The confrontation, the resolution. So they, they the climax of the film whatever they were leading up to is is happening or for the tv show it's the climax of the episode the story is at an end and then it's the falling action the stuff that happens after that so you can apply this to anything the lord of the rings they have the setup showing the hobbit and the ring and he's getting it and then the confrontation is him how is he going to get to his end goal and then the resolution is he finally does it and they're showing us what happens after where and that applies to all sorts of movies, all sorts of TV shows, episodes, and things like that. Now, three act structures are broken up like that. And TV shows can either adopt that. This one is used a lot in film. TV shows typically, uh, apparently they go for more of a like a five act structure, um, which looks more of something like this. And I would say it's probably because they used to have commercials in them. So they try to break the action apart where you could insert a commercial where you have oh. the prologue and then you have the conflict, the rising action in act three, the falling action in act four, and what happens after the, the falling action, the climax in act five. And so it's still the same. It's leading up to something. It's starting out. It's telling us about the world, the characters. It's leading up to how are they going to get this done or what are they going to do? And then it gets to the climax and then it has the what happens now? Does it go back to normal? Is nothing ever going to be normal again? How are the characters? And it evens back out at the end. So it's the same thing as a three act structure. It's just split up into more pieces. Yeah. Um, somebody had this. I thought it was a pretty good 
thing for like half hour sitcoms they did like a little eight part um i think it's eight intro of the protagonist want what is the what is their goal that's the first thing intro of protagonist main obstacle what's standing in the way of their goal is it themselves is it somebody else is it some situation intro of a protagonist plan to overcome the obstacle what is their plan to overcome this what is their plan to beat it and to get what they want, their goal. Number four, minor obstacles and changes to protagonist approach. What is the pushback on that plan? That initial plan isn't working out or there's something unexpected that comes up. And so then they have to either rethink their plan or push forward. Number five, repetition. What are the protagonist trials and errors? So they keep trying different things maybe and then they keep failing or they're trying different routes. Potential B stories, part six. What are the other characters' separate desires? Final attempt at success, number seven. What is the protagonist's final plan? And now that they've run into some obstacles, what's their final goal for getting what they want, or final plan for getting to that goal? <clears throat> number eight, make or break. Does the final plan succeed or fail? Number nine, long-term effects or return to normalcy. Is there a return to normal or is there a new normal? And so they say like that could be how you set up a half hour sitcom story. That could be the structure of it. Doesn't always have to be the case, of course, but um, that is how a lot of sitcoms are set up. And if you look at a sitcom episode and you kind of apply this to it, you can see where it all happens. Now, B story, that doesn't necessarily have to come after the initial like trial and error of the main character. The B story could start at the very beginning or it could be like right after part one you know it doesn't really matter and there's usually a, there can't even be a c story which is even smaller even more minor in a sitcom there's three different stories going on at once it really depends on how many characters you have um, but that's usually how sitcoms will do it they have they have multiple stories going on at once an a story which is the main story of the episode a b story which is semi-important but not as much and a c story which is something small minor Maybe it's about a side character and one of the main characters, or it's just about two side characters. And so it's not really that important. Um, and it's the smallest section of the, of the episode. Very interesting, all this kind of stuff and how it's structured and like, there's a lot that goes into every single, every single piece and part. So it's cool. And like, there's a lot of thought that goes into this kind of stuff, I'm sure. Oh yeah. And there's like so many different structures and basically I would say like they all kind of do the same thing, but it's just a way to kind of keep it structured. Depending on what your show is, you kind of want to adopt one of these so that you are making sure it follows a structure of some sort because you can make interesting stories and completely different. They use Rick and Morty as an example. Actually, this is the, the guy that writes Rick and Morty, one of them anyway, he, uh, made this little story wheel, character wheel, saying like that's how they kind of set up the episodes of Rick and Morty. And if you watch Rick and Morty, you can see that they have very interesting and different stories within that structure. But if you look at the structure, you can kind of see it happening in each episode. Um, before or after it started being super random? It still follows a structure like this most of the time. If you, look I will at definitely be looking into the new season and analyzing this because that is something that everyone's like, oh, it just feels like before it used to have structure and now it's just balls to the wall and say, so we'll see. So how they, uh, yeah, I mean, and that's the other thing. Like if you have a structure and you have it set up in a show and then the writers decide to go against it or change the structure, it will be subconsciously noticed and people might like it or people might hate it. It just depends on. Yeah. Like a character factors. choice, a story choice that the writers of Rick and Marty did that a lot of people didn't like was the first uh, two and a uh, two and a half, two seasons, I believe, I believe two to two and a half. They seem to be following somewhat of a character development and character growth and it seemed like there were lessons being learned and people growing, even if it was tiny, but just enough for us to see that time is passing. And then they decided to be like, well, screw this. Let's just unlearn, make this character unlearn the lesson that they just learned and because it's more fun that way. And some people were like, okay, 
fair enough. It's still funny. It's fine. And other people were like, it just kind of feels cheap now because it just seems like he's learning the same lesson and it doesn't feel earned anymore. Like, yeah, it's still somewhat funny, but it, it just feels like all over the place and like we're running in circles and we're not really getting anywhere. So a lot of people were a little divided after season three and especially after season four because holy crap season four but um they were just all right what are we just random now that's okay if it is but let's try to figure out what we are and so that that can divide your fans too like if you decide that you want to take your show in a different direction or if you thought this was the way you wanted to make it but now you're like you know what this I think this would be more fun or more interesting if we did this like a drastic change in storyline or a drastic change in um pacing or um structure something like that can also alienate your audience or even draw more attention depending on if you do it well yeah that's true actually yeah it depends on like you know, there's so many artistic things that you can do and that's why I guess it's good to get it on to like the, the like for me like if I, I, I'm trying to write like um a story what I do is like I actually write out like the main plots first and then I kind of just start building from there then bare bones and then start filling in um so I mean yeah yeah any change you're going to alienate some people but at the end of the day you have to like figure out what you want and give your hopefully in my opinion give your audience some structure and stability so they know what to expect like okay this is what the show is um all right and if you change it too much you know so all right so um yes i don't think it happened in season three i think that was in pickle rick or whatever came out and everyone was going crazy over that i think it happened after season four or during season four and into season five. But, oh, I'm just um, talking about the shift in tone uh, in like structure, not the episode sucking after that. <laughs> that season, end of season four gotcha. and five. Well, one thing about Rick and Morty is it's very episodic. And so it doesn't really have as, I mean, they try to, they call back to episodes and they keep little moments in, but it doesn't have a linear path. So it also depends on what your story is, what kind of structure you want to adopt. For Rick and Morty, each episode has this sort of wheel or at least it used to so it started out there in a a zone of comfort every episode they usually start out in their house eating or watching something or doing whatever something comfortable but then they want something either he wants to go out with somebody or he wants to i don't know go on an adventure or whatever so they enter an unfamiliar situation rick brings them into another galaxy or they go into another planet or whatever or they do something stupid that causes a consequence that they have to fix and then number four they adapt to it they have to figure out okay i'm in this new unfamiliar situation how do i get out alive or how do i adapt to it they get what they wanted but they paid a heavy price then they return to their familiar situation having changed and so that is kind of like how they do it each episode and it doesn't mean it carries over and that might be one of the people's complaints is that when the per- the character changes in the episode, they aren't still changed in the next episode. They are back to how they were before the whole episode even began. That's and- a hilarious concept. That's just awesome. I like that. It's funny. So <laughs> they're back to square one again, and they do it again, and it's hilarious. <laughs> I mean, it depends on point. what it is, but it can be funny. Like <laughs> like a lot of cartoons do that. But if you're doing something like really impactful, really emotional, and you're um, doing multiple episodes that hint to it, like some of Rick's development and sacrifices that he makes, and then completely go back to, oh, no, he's just selfish. He doesn't care about anyone. Oh, this is, that's one of the main things that people complain about a lot. Right. It's like, which so is like it? This... That doesn't make sense. Yeah. Because like, yeah, that, that wouldn't flow with the story because you can see that, that if there's been so much story development, you're like, that's just not the case. Right. Yeah. And so this is a, um, something that sometimes people will apply instead of applying it per episode. If it's more of an entire season or series that is, is leading one story, they will use one of these structures for the series, for the season. And then they will use something similar, but not exactly the same for episodes. So um, one person was saying that 
basically if you're making a series and you're going to continue a show and it's going to be a linear continuous story then you're going to have your episodes they're in a zone of comfort they go to number two they want something so they enter an unfamiliar situation and then it's just going number four number four number three number four number three because if they get what they wanted then that show is probably over and that unless it's a self-contained happen. show like a sitcom or a cartoon that is normally more self-contained into separate storylines right if it's episodic lines. yeah if it's not episodic then it then the season or the show if it's a continuous story of one story then uh, the character is going to be at number four breaking bad he can never get what he wants because that's the end of the show so he doesn't get what he wants until near the end and they could do number five and then it's number six Even number then. seven number eight in one of the last seasons and then lead up to the the, the aftermath of everything but um, they say like, you know, you, they're just going to be going back and forth between going to unfamiliar situations or maybe going back to two. They want something new, but they're never going to exceed past four because right when they get what they wanted, unless they realize they don't want it anymore, uh, it's not going to I have anywhere say, to go from there for say, the show. It's going to it's going to stop there for the most part. If it's a continuous story, one story, I would argue that sometimes episodic ones like sitcoms. I would argue that sometimes you can have them get what they wanted and pay heavy price. And then the next season is about what that price entails. And then yeah, I said it doesn't have to be the entire series. Sometimes it's just the entire season. And the next season's about a new thing. But if it's not episodic, then it it won't get to they get what they wanted until near the end um, of the season or the series. Unless you do what uh, some TV shows, which is like a um, season one A and season one B, which is another way of doing it, which not a lot of shows do, but some do, where you will like, re- re- because it has a lot of storylines, they will reveal one of them in the first part, and then the second part will be them dealing with that situation or consequences or whatever. Mm. That's another way of breaking the season down that I've seen. Gotcha. Yeah. Well, either way, it's like it doesn't um, if you don't want it to be episodic, it can't be a contained story within itself to have fully gone over the, the, the main conflict. Like like Sarah said earlier, you can have you have the little things, you know, maybe they have this little character wheels or this little three act structure of he's hungry this episode and he wants to make a steak, but he's never made food before. So now here we go. And that's the whole setup. Now the confrontation is he's burning the house down and whatever else, but he finally makes a steak and he gets to eat it and he enjoys it or he doesn't. That's Other that thing. little story inside of a bigger story of the season, maybe being that he wants to prove to himself and his parents that he's old enough to move out of the house and be on his own. While the series as a whole is him just figuring out life. And so there's these different structures, these different overall overarching story arcs for the characters and the story as a whole happening over each episode and happening over each season as well as each episode and within and that episode thing. even you can have you can have three different characters have little tiny arcs but what i was meaning with this is like if you get them to get what they wanted that deep core thing that they wanted breaking bad he wants to take care of his family before he dies And so he wants to make sure he gets enough money so that they are taken care of. If he gets that before season one ends, then he doesn't really have as much of a motivator to keep going. Here's the thing, right? You didn't watch all the Breaking Bad. I know, I know, I know. He can get it and he can still go. He can decide that's not really what he wanted or he paid a heavy price for it to where he doesn't really care about that anymore. That can be something different. Yeah, I was just going to say, like, he, he, the cancer, spoiler for Breaking Bad. (laughs) <laughs> like he, I'm not the, the cancer, yet. I'm just talking about the first episode. Okay, but I'm just saying that the, the, something happens where like his motive becomes completely different because things that change. Um, but um, another thing to consider, like you said, is with TV shows, we are more often dealing with multiple characters. Um, we're following mo- more than one story. We're following more than one main character. So 
that's another thing that we have to consider is we're developing and giving separate little storylines, like you said, to the, to more than one character. And that's and you can another even thing. argue. Oh, go ahead. Uh, no, you want to finish? Oh, I was going to say, and you can even argue that maybe taking care of his family wasn't really his main goal. Maybe his main goal was Started living, that way. living life in a different way before he dies because he's so used to following the rules. Gaining respect, being powerful because he never had that in his life, in his marriage, in his career, or anything. So maybe that was his really his underlying goal while we thought his main goal was this other thing. It just depends on what the show is. Or it began is, it, that way, but then it evolved, yes. Um, I, I just mean, like, it, it is also interesting to consider that you have to give... Um, the thing with shows, especially episodic ones, but a lot of shows, almost every show, is that you will have to give little victories and smaller storylines where there are conclusions within the seasons and within the shows, because otherwise it will never feel resolved and it'll just be something that's extended a million times and it'll either feel cheap or it'll feel like, oh, they are just pulling stuff out of a hat. They don't know where they're going with this. Um, a lot of shows suffer from that when they have like a main story and they just, oh crap, we need to, uh, we can't let it end because it's, we're running out of stuff. We need to add one more thing and one more thing to make it go longer. That's another thing that you have to be really careful with. Um, but especially with sitcoms and, and cartoons and shows that are more character-based, you will have a lot of individual stories within the main story, if not just individual stories each episode, because it is more character-based. And so in our life, we go through a lot of, a lot of things that some take longer and some are shorter. So some things will be resolved quicker and other things will take years, months, you know, longer. And that's another thing to consider when creating your story. I, in my opinion. Yeah, there's lots of things, yeah. Yeah, and then there's, um, so for other structures within the show or for your whole series, they also, or, or per episode, they also do a four act structure, which is again, it's the same kind of thing. Conflict starting, it's introducing whatever's happening, rising action, the action rises even more until it gets to a, a conclusion or a climax, and then it mellows out. Or maybe it doesn't mellow out that episode. You know, you could have a two or three episode um, continuation of one, one story act. So it just really depends on what you're trying to do. But each episode, each story that you have, no matter how big or small, you're going to have one of these types of structures to it, whether you realize it or not. A lot of shows that go on for multiple seasons, their first season, when you look back at it, was a lot of setup. They're setting up throughout the entire thing. They are, there's new details you're learning every episode. Oh, they had a mom. Oh, they used to be married. Oh, their mom died, you know, or they don't like their dad. But you so also might that, be closing other storylines or concluding them or giving closure to a few so that it doesn't feel like it's just a pile. But... They are setting up a lot of stuff with yeah. main overarching backstory for the characters and the story going forward. When you look back Ooh. at it from a series perspective, looking back at each season. That's another thing. That's another thing. You can, um, I think you can add to, like an arc and almost and finish it and then add some another layer to it later on as well. Like an, add an extra layer of dimension to the story like, oh, it, it was about this, but now we added this into the mix. How's it going to work now, you know? How is that going to change the dynamic? How is that going to change the motivation, the story, the, you know? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. But, um, yeah, so there's plenty of different ways to do it. And there's plenty of different, there's even a six-hack story, which I've never heard of. Uh, apparently... Shows will either go for, most TV shows will either go for a four act or five act structure. Um, I don't know the exact reason. Like I said, it might be something to do with commercials. It might just be how they are set to do it. Just like with film, a lot of people will just go for a three act structure 
which is like by this page, it's going to start being like this. And then after that page, it's going to be, you know, within 22 pages, I'm going to be done with my first act. And then for the next 70 pages, I'm going to be on act two. And then I'm going to wrap up with 30. Sometimes pages. it's just to help find balance within the story. And so that it feels balanced, like we're not doing too, too much of one thing and not enough of another, or we're giving sufficient time to each character or to each aspect of the story, or we're developing each aspect well. Yeah. And um, I'm going to say it's almost like music again. Like I use this a lot because I write music. Um, well, you pick, right? Like, so it's like there's always like the, like, you could have a voice chorus set up, a double voice chorus, like again. So I kind of like view this like act is like most like a lot of like shows are basic stuff like the one but then you have like an artist come in and be like oh right away right, writing out um come in and be like no to do six act structure for this because it's just going to flow different uh, for the type of story that i'm writing and that's kind of mm -hmm. cool too if they know exactly what they want and how to write it and they just come in and they go yeah yeah, 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 yeah we're gonna add this here we're gonna add this here character development over here um an underlining story here and like implications over here and here yeah and it's kind of like flows right kinda how I, kinda and so like usually writing. with a with a writing if you have a writing group um they yeah. will usually kind of know the structure that they're all gonna go yeah. with uh, because the episodes yeah. need to follow a similar structure to feel like that show and that's yeah. why yeah. you'll see that's why that the writer of Rick and Morty, or at least one of them, they decided that they were, I think he's the lead writer. And so he decided, you know, this is going to be our story arc for, for the episodes. You know, this, this eight act plot thing, this character wheel. Um, and that's, this will how they'll go. So each episode kind of feels familiar, but they are different stories within them. They just have a different, a, its own structure. But if you look at the top of like the six act structure, you can see it's all based on the same stuff, the setup, the confrontation and the resolution. It's just how you break those things up into how many different pieces that makes it a three act, four act, five act or six act structure or eight point, 12 point character wheel, however you wanna do it. It's all going to be, you need to set it up, you need to explain what is happening in the episode for that episode story. If it's the pilot episode, it's the most difficult thing for writers for pilot episodes are that they have to figure out how to set up the entire world of that show as well as the episode's plot within that small time frame. Mm -hmm. And that is why a lot of some pilots will be an extension, like an extra long pilot. It might be an hour long for a usual 30 minute episode show or it might be a two hour long drama that's kind of like a TV movie in a way um, because they need to set up so much stuff and get through explaining what everything is, who the characters are and all this stuff. So that's why pilot episodes are imperative to, to, to the show. It's setting up the entire season, the entire series and the episode all in one. Makes sense. But yeah, so for this six act thing, they say act one is dealing with an imperfect situation. Act two is learning the rules of that unfamiliar situation. Act three is stumbling into the central conflict. Act four is implementing a doomed plan. Act five, trying a long shot. Act six, living in a new situation. And so that's not always the case. Again, it could be back to the set the way it already was. I was going to say, it's not always that specific, like exactly like that, but it's just to give you an idea of, okay, this is how to break it down and you can replace it with the story that you are thinking in your mind. It's not right. always going to be exactly that. And each writer writes differently. They all decide to um, if you are writing it yourself anyway, if you're in a group, then you all have to come to terms with how are we going to write this? What's the structure going to be for everybody? But if you're writing it on your own, if you're writing a pilot episode, for instance, then you pick what structure to do. You pick what works best for your story and how you write. So if you like to write the major plots first, if you like to write the middle, the beginning and end little like a little snippet of what happens just so you know where it's going and then fill it in like Sarah or if you want to be I've heard some writers they like to just start and see where it goes and then go back and like reshape it 
And so it just really depends on how you want to write it. There's no right or wrong answers in this. Uh, but each, each show is going to have some kind of structure for the most part. They don't always follow it, you know, every single episode or every single time, but the season will have its own structure. The series will have its own structure and each episode is going to have its own structure of some sort that you have to, uh, that you have to do. This stuff comes from masterclass.com. It is how to write a TV script, a guide to starting your career in television writing, letter H. TV scripts, obviously they're shorter than film scripts. Film has a clear beginning, middle, and end, where TV scripts can have multiple beginnings, middles, and ends, or they might not even have the ends and then they could be setting up for another episode. TV scripts don't have to resolve every story right away. TV scripts are usually dialogue driven and rely more on characters and dialogue to help tell the story instead of through visuals and cinematography as much as film does. Typically for network TV, they use five act structures. Act one is introducing the characters and a problem. Act two is escalating the problem. Act three, have the worst case scenario happen. Act four, begin the ticking clock. Act five, have the characters reach their moment of victory. TV also often has A, B, and C storylines, especially if it's sitcoms. Storyline involves your main character. The A storyline involves your main character and is the core of the show or the episode. B storyline is secondary and helps the narrative keep moving forward. C storyline, sometimes called the runner, is smallest storyline and holds the least weight. With sitcoms, you'll have more lighthearted topics normally. There will be fewer act breaks, and the time you have to tell each story is much shorter. Sitcoms are around 21 minutes without commercials, where drama is usually around 43 minutes without commercials. The main thing about TV writing is keeping people interested and engaged, wanting them to want to keep coming back. This is done with characters, world building, world building and central themes. Does anybody have any questions, comments, or anything to add? Obviously, you know, it's writing, so there's a lot of subjectivity to it. And uh, there's no right or wrong answers, like I was saying. Like, well, the way, the way one answer, person does it might not be the way another does it. My thing is, like, if the network likes it and it's green lit and you're doing well and the audience loves it, then it doesn't matter. You know what I mean? Like, it's like you mean you need the basis of structure and stuff, but like if it's like doing really well and it's doing really well and you're you're winning, so I mean, uh, yeah, that's my thoughts on that. Yeah, and usually like it's not going to do that if you pilot. don't give them a pilot. Well, it's obviously it's not going to do it unless you give them a pilot that draws their attention and makes exactly. them want to be in that world, it makes them want to see what these characters do, where they go, and draw their interest to get on a network. Makes sense, yeah. And then once that goes, you just keep going with it. And uh, yeah, I feel like it's like any other like aspect of film. You start like learning like the basics, and then it's just like it ends up being like nuances. And then people will come in and be like, "We don't like this. We like this. Change this." And, it, and it's like that, yeah. Yeah, they always give feedback. If it's, if you're getting on a network, they're gonna give you plenty of feedback for for different episodes from executives, and they'll give you they'll sign you some writers if you don't know anybody, and you you they're gonna give you a team. If you, unless you say you can do it all yourself, but then you're going to have a schedule, which is usually why people have a, uh, a team because they want, you know, they can't meet that schedule or not write out that much good content that quickly. No, and that's true. And that's the truth. Like I'm noticing for like every single like area and film, like every single department, because once you get like huge network, like the, it's just like the amount of workload is actually insane. There's, you're not yeah. doing stuff by yourself versus like, again, like some indies and stuff that are like, a lot simpler and smaller um it's a little it's different because it's it's waste the scale is like a lot smaller you can't have it any other way at certain levels or certain skills because it's just and they're they were more interested in about getting stuff out in the time but like it's done very differently yeah right but i mean i still think that like doing stuff at um, a smaller scale is good because if you get really good at the small what and smooth it out like if you oh written something and it was successful on an indie level and you want to move up or something like that it's going to be a lot easier because you've already like had success already felt the flow at like a scale that's 
normal or you might write something and just it ends up going to the big studios and they take over and do it i mean it, you, you just you never know like things happen differently for every single story that you'll talk to um or hear about for every single professional in each job right yeah and uh the only the the thing i'd add to that is the, the other difference with writing film obviously is or not film writing tv obviously is that um there's not really independent tv out there and so because it's all network driven or it's streaming services and stuff you have to get you and it costs so much you usually have to get a network to buy your thing or some kind of media company to buy out your show and so what independent writers for tv if you're looking to get into tv do is they write either the pilot episode or they um try to do a web series and those are like the independent ways of doing a tv show and that's how uh independent people will do it if they don't have the funding for it and even web series can be expensive we'll talk about that later in the semester but web series can get quite expensive too depending on what what the web series is about Again, like you're going to have funding from other things. You're either going to have grants to fund it or you're going to be working with somebody. You're going to have uh, somebody funding money. I mean, like, you know, you're not going to make something out of nothing um, unless you're doing like you can. If you owned a house, like if you had something in like even in my apartment and you have like a really good idea and you have like just the right amount of equipment to make it look good and it's all done in one location and it's just hilarious, like say a sitcom or something like those ways around things. So uh, not for TV because TV has to be distributed in some way and you can't get on a tv channel just from making it which is where web series comes in so you would do a web well, yeah, series it's only a deal and you still have to like meet the requirements i'm just saying like there's just there's different levels of like you see you still it's still gonna cost money you have to have the equipment yeah that's not what i'm saying i'm just saying like it's not it's not like you don't have to be a hundred million dollar company to get on like a web series you can do I mean, it's gonna still be money but it's not the same like that's unreachable in the lifetimes for some people. So I mean, like, it really depends. Right. I mean, it depends where you want the web series, how you're able to distribute it. I mean, yeah, it yeah. depends on what you're calling the web yeah. series too. Like, there's can be web series that you make. People have made web series in their home, like like you're saying, and they've made them. Um, we'll we'll talk about web series later. Uh, once we get to web series, it's in a few weeks. But basically. There, there's all sorts of web series. There's, you know, just the YouTube channel web series that somebody makes in their room, or there's the actual, like, basically a TV show, but it's just a web series, um, those kinds. And so we'll talk all about that more later, but there are multiple ways to do it. But for independence with like little budgets, you know, with film, you can do an independent film and you can do it for however much you're able to do it for. With TV, you can't. You, you can make it a web series for however much you want, but you can't actually make a TV show that's on TV without it having some kind of budget and backing from a network because they are the ones that own all of these channels and are the ones who distribute the TV. But, that um, makes sense. So you'd have to have the right context in the right places. Right. Ideally, all right, so this stuff, we're talking now about how money is distributed in film. And this stuff comes from Stephen follows.com letter i in the syllabus underneath how money is distributed in filmmaking the way a film's income is collected and distributed is known as the recoupment waterfall or the revenue waterfall depending on who you ask but usually it's either one or the other recoupment because everyone's trying to recoup their costs and it's called the waterfall because it's going to go in stages and go to each um, person on the way down. This one is kind of upside down, but it starts with the customers at the bottom. You can see the money and then you can see the money up going to the theater. If you're doing a um, theatrical distribution, the theater takes their cut. Now you have one less dollar and the distributor takes their cut. You have one less dollar. And then the producer gets about $4 out of that six. Obviously it's going to be a different than that. The producer is going to have probably like $2 or one out if they only had six coming in, but um, that kind of shows it upside down of how the waterfall works in a split second. It just goes from one thing, they take their cut to the next thing, taking their cut until it finally reaches the filmmaker or the producer of the project. Stephen Follows actually made a graphic which shows how the money is split and trickled down. So firstly, gross, before we start, the gross income is the money 
before any deductions or taxes are taken out. So if you don't know that gross income just means that there hasn't been any money taking their part and there hasn't been any taxes taken out for like sales tax and things like that. Net income is the money after taxes and deductions are taken out. So in this case, gross is before one of these entities take their cut, net is after they take their cut or at least their expenses and then pass it down to the next person, which gets their then gross money and then becomes the net money. So an example of a recoupment waterfall for an independent feature film. Down here in the lower left, we see that the little gray boxes are taxes and costs. So every time you sell a ticket, every time somebody buys something online from you, it is going to have a sales tax that is going to take out a part of the revenue that you would have gotten from the entire ticket price. So if the price is $12 and let's say taxes are 10%, it's gonna take $1.20 out of your money and you're gonna end up getting, um, what is it, like $1.80, I mean, $10.80 mm -hmm. passed down. So there you go, taxes and costs come out first. The blue, the light blue area he says is the part that's withheld means they're taking their part, they're taking their cut. And the blue, dark blue is the part that is passed on. So you can have different revenue streams for a project. If you did a, if you did an independent feature film, you did it successfully and you are able to get distribution for theaters, non-theaters, video on demand, television, home entertainment, which is like DVDs and Blu-rays, other, which could be uh, merchandise and stuff like that. Then, you know, you'll have all these revenue streams coming in and you'll make more or less money from, from each of these, depending on how successful they are in each. You might be very successful in the theaters, but not successful anywhere else. You might be very successful on video on demand, but not successful in theaters. It just depends. Well, I mean, it doesn't <clears throat> much matter where you're successful as long as you're succeeding at one of exactly all right uh, so if you are having theatrical distribution the theater themselves takes their cut out of the money and so then that gets chopped up and then they give the rest of the money down to the next person which is the distributor non-theatrical they take their cut whatever uh whatever that implies i'm not really sure exactly what non-theatrical implies since we have video on demand and television over here but whatever is non-theatrical that's still showing the movie somehow, whoever's showing it is going to take out their cut of the profits. Home entertainment, the cost of making it, if you are selling, if you get a distributor that's able to get in contact with Target, Best Buy, Walmart, and they're going to sell your DVDs and Blu-rays, they're going to take their profits out of that. And you also see the little gray box, which is taking out the taxes for each one of those DVDs or Blu-rays that are sold. And so the dark blue part is the one being uh, passed down. Television, they just pay to show it because they're getting their revenue from TV ads. So they don't really take out a part from it. They're actually paying the distributor to have access to the TV show, or the, I mean, not, not the TV show, the film to show on TV. And so they just take out for whatever the, say taxes and costs are for that, if it's advertising or whatever, and they pass down the rest of the money. Video on demand, whatever platform you are on, they're gonna take a percentage of the profits, whether it's a advertisement-based one, subscription-based one, whatever, they're going to take out part of the profits and then give you the rest. Sorry, if it's subscription-based, like Netflix, they're gonna pay, pay a flat fee to you to get it on their platform. But if it's a transactional video on demand one where you're where somebody's renting it or they're buying it, like maybe through Amazon, or it's a, a free one with ads, then they're going to take out some of the profits and keep it for that platform. Mm -hmm. And then other as third parties, that could be anybody that's creating the merchandise and whatever else other falls under, they're gonna take out that stuff all the taxes that come with that sales tax and everything and pass down the rest of the money to the distributor. 
Now the distributor has their gross income, the entire thing before they take out any expenses or deductions. And they're going to take out their, they're going to recoup their costs, their P&A costs, which let me see, this stands for, where is that? Print and advertising costs. So if they're showing it to a theater, all the actual film that they have to deliver, whether it's a uh, digital cinema package or if you are actually distributing real film stock, then they have to make it one for each theater, one for each screening. And so um, they will have multiples of that that's going to go into the cost, advertising, making the poster art, all of that stuff is going to go in their costs. So when they get the gross income, which is the entirety of the income before they take out their cut, they're going to recoup their costs. They're going to get back all the money that they spent to distribute this film. Then the net income received after they take out their fees and expenses, now they're going to take out their percentage from it. They're going to take out their, their cut, whatever the deal was. He said, you get 20%. Now they take out that 20%. And then they pass it on down to the next thing. If you had a sales agent, they are going to then, that's going to be considered their gross income coming from the distributor. You can see it's getting smaller and smaller. And so they're going to recoup any costs that they put into it. And then they're going to pass down all the rest. And now their net income from the sales agent, now that's when they take out their fee. All right, their fee and their recoupment of all the expenses that they've put in have been paid. So now they're passing the rest of it down to the producer or the filmmaker, whoever is over the financials of the actual film itself. They are going to repay the budget and then they're going to pass down which is, you know, repay the loan that they took out or however they got the money, they're gonna repay their investors or whatever. And then they're gonna pass down the rest to the very bottom, which is the producer's net profit. He also goes on to mention how at the very bottom, it's the producers, it's called the producer's net profits, which is the money that makes it back to the production company. But that then is going to get split even further Typically, investors are paid back what they put in in full. And then they have like a 50-50 split between investors pool and producers pool of money to a certain dollar amount where they split and keep going further and further, splitting it more and more in the producer's favor as more money comes in. So if you make a huge crap ton of money, you know, your film is, is extremely well uh, received and you you just got so much money coming in you're going to repay the budget first of all so whatever investors you have or whatever loans or anything you took out you have to repay all that first and then you also have deals with the investors because they didn't just give you money to make back their money they were trying to also see if they can make a profit on top and so um, he says typically what that what happens is there's the money's then split into two pools, producer's pool and investor's pool. So however many investors you have are going to take profit from that pool of money going towards the investors. And so when it reaches that bottom, that producer's net profit it gets split into two, half and half, going towards the investors and going towards all the producers of the show or the, or the film, I mean. Mm -hmm. To a certain dollar amount, usually. So you might say, you know, we made, we got ten thousand dollars from you. Once we get the money, you get one hundred percent of the profits until you get your ten thousand dollars back, and then we're going to split it fifty-fifty up until fifteen thousand dollars, and then we're going to start splitting it sixty-forty until this dollar amount, and then we're going to start splitting it 70-30, 80-20, 90-10. And then a hundred going toward us if we go over a hundred thousand dollars, you know, whatever the dollar amount is, that's usually how it is in those contracts for investors. That way they don't just make 50% of the profits for their forevermore. Um, but it depends on what kind of deals and what kind of contracts you make. Well, like again, like if you're doing really well, like it's, it's <laughs> well, like there's a lot of things, yeah, exactly. Like when it comes to number games and things like that, and you have to be careful and you have to make sure that like 
you know, things are done properly and fairly. And I mean, that's why often on like big shows and stuff, you have union board. So that makes sure that like nobody ever gets like taken advantage of um, on big shows. It's a little like, because it's yeah. easier to negotiate on like indies and stuff because it's smaller, like there's less money involved. If you're talking about like a $200 million show, it would be so easy, right? So that's the way, you know, all the crew works out of a union. Same right. with all of the. Um, and the cast as well they have the they're out of the union too so i mean that, that way that, that so that part's taken care of but i find this like really interesting like seeing how all like, at the top the very top like all of the 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 big like you know distribution like theatrical non-theatrical home entertainment that's really cool and and and, and, and interesting all this kind of stuff um, yeah and like just seeing and, how much like you could have made a huge amount of money which we'll i'll show in a second but like even if the film makes a bunch of money, that doesn't mean the actual filmmaker made a bunch of money because by the time it's passed down to them, everybody's taken out a percentage of something. And so then it's like a lot less by the time it reaches the bottom and it could still be a good amount, but it's not anywhere near the amount that you hear from like box office sales if they were able to have a theatrical release as an independent filmmaker. Yeah, no, like there's, there's definitely, yeah, there's a lot of things that go into it. And again, like, you know, oftentimes, you know, producers are not, there's like, there's a lot of things that go into it. Like, you don't just like end up working on some big feature film as your first everything. Oftentimes, like all these people and these things have picked, you know, one area that, or one or two areas or like um, surrounding areas to get really good at and they just get good and that's what they do. Mm -hmm. And then you have producers again, as we know, like the other producers who uh, aren't actually, it's, it's, they're not, Fronting the money, they just work on part of the production team. Yeah. Interesting. Um, yeah, and so you'll have those different teams. The executive producer are usually the ones who are going to get the actual financing and everything. So they're usually the ones that get the biggest cut of that profit. Yeah. But again, it's it depends on what kind of contracts every crew member had and what investors had because those agreements can vastly change the amount of money going to any one person or group because yes. of uh you know anything like that so it also depends on of course your agreements and contracts with the distributors and the sales agents and if you had a producer's rep because they all get a certain fee so if you negotiate a smaller fee more money is going to come down the waterfall but if you negotiate a, a larger fee for them so that they accept you then obviously less money will come down to you if any money is being made so it's a lot of it's a lot of different things that go into and this is yeah. why it's so complicated to um, just explain to somebody why a film costs so much or why, you know, you made a bunch of money, but you didn't really because your film made money, but that doesn't mean it's all given to you. And yeah, so, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of things and there's other things to consider too, like the long game too. Like if your film, like your first film makes, goes really big, you don't really make much from it, but like your first film ever like goes really big and like thing, the likelihood that you'll be able to get better distribution deals is gonna increase, which will increase the waterfall, which mm -hmm. then the likelihood of you making money on a second film is actually a lot higher. Cause you right. success. Cause now you have more leverage and you can negotiate exactly. a little bit and then the more success you'll keep going with successes until like you have a huge fail but if you have like five successes before you a, a big fail is probably recoverable and you can come up versus like having a big fail on your first ever film which is what you want to avoid which is why you should always go in um you know having like a huge understanding and knowledge of you know film or having people you trust on board that do mm -hmm. in my opinion that's the place if i mean some people will risk things and they lights people fail all the time so yeah, it's got their but yeah it is good to be careful because a lot of things we'll get into that in a second too um because there's a lot of ways to kind of do some accounting tricks up the up the ladder where a certain net income percentage players like people who wanted to take a percentage of net profits aren't going to make anything because they're going to make sure that nothing gets down to the bottom um, but we'll talk about that in just a minute that's so there, there's definitely, definitely want to keep track of everything. And this is why when we're talking about distributors, talking about sales agents, you want to make sure that you have final say over any agreements that they have with a third party company to make sure that they aren't making an agreement that's not going to be in your favor later on. So that if your film definitely. does make money, you end up seeing at least some fraction of it instead of it just going all to some other company. But, um, definitely, and that, that that keeps you in the game too. Like also, like too, and it's just like it's a better way, in my opinion, at those kinds of levels. It's a better way of, of 
of doing things because you know you can also yeah keeping track of things and having them like all line up and like yeah doing your best to negotiate and then also knowing when to give in um instead of having like a project like get completely thrown away and and how much to give in and where to fight and how to fight yeah there's lots of things yeah and so it's good to know the business side of things to know where to negotiate and where to do all that to um and when to call to really it figure out where you want to negotiate what you want to fight for and that's why it's good again i'm going to say this again i've said this like last all three weeks past three weeks you want to get an entertainment lawyer if you can and you want to get a producer's rep or sales agent because they're going to help you get the best deal and they're going to know the people that can distribute your film the best most of the time if you get a good one you know and so you always want to be looking out for who you're signing on with and make sure that you have a good company or a good person that's representing you so that you can get a good deal and you have, they have your best interest in heart because they, they're going to make more money by making you more money in the long run. So they're going to try to get the best deal possible up the ladder as it keeps going up. That's true. Um, like a team, a team effort that's actually done right. And like where both sides are happy, like, if the companies are happy with like the percentage that they get and there's still enough coming down the waterfall and like everybody's happy, that's like the perfect deal because it's like, okay, yeah, we're making a pretty good chunk here and there's still enough to go down the waterfall to make all the effort and everything else like super worth it. And it goes down to like the entire filmmakers and everything else. Um, then the likelihood of you making another movie and being a repeat customer to all of those huge networks um, increases. Yeah. Right. I mean, if they completely fail or like the, Nobody comes down to like a producer or they go bankrupt. You're not going to see anything creatively from them again. Right. So, all right. so balance, I guess. Yeah, definitely. Um, all right. So with the investors, that's usually how the deals work. It's not with every agreement. Some investors might have different terms in their contract, like being paid before other investors. If they are, if they are investing a lot more money than everyone else, they might say, okay, but you're going to pay me back before you pay all them back because I'm putting up the most risk. I'm putting triple as much money as everyone else. And so I get all of my money back before anyone else even sees an amount. And then, you know, you have to make sure the other investors are good with that for the most part. If you are trying to do like a good, uh, if you're trying to do honest business, then you want to make sure all the other investors are aware that this first investor gets all their money back first, if they have an agreement like that. Or well, say, an investor like, might have a fixed amount that they want for like a profit instead of a percentage for their return. So in their contract, they might say, I'm giving you $10,000. And if it makes money, I want to get back 50% on top as a gain. So I want to get $15,000 back instead of I saying I get 50% of the profits and whatever else, they'll say that instead. Um, and so that can vastly change the bottom line of how of where the money goes yeah fair enough yeah i would say like yeah splitting it like properly like you know instead of like being like oh you one investor gets all the money back we're talking like you like uh, small money it doesn't really matter because it's like but like we're talking huge money it well if it's if it adds up it does well but i mean even still like if i was a million if i had two million bucks and i was doing a film and it cost me like five thousand it would you know that's what i'm saying like it just it's truly dependent but we're talking about like the likelihood that it's big money so i think it would matter so i would say like having one investor who's fronted you know more money getting everything back might not be comfortable even like say you have three investors one person fronted 50 percent, the other two fronted 25 that's still a lot of money yeah. So it'd be like, okay, you get your 25 first, and then we all see the rest of the 25 equally. That might right. be. Yeah, I, I would that's say a good, that's, that's a good actually... idea for like a, a tr contract too. The and main thing, say... the main thing is you're trying to get money for your film. And so that's why a lot of people will just take whatever they can get. And sometimes if your film's successful, that can be a big problem later on because you took a bad deal. Um, you gave them a better deal than everyone else and you didn't tell anyone else and they thought they were going to get paid back equally, you know, so there's certain things that you have to make sure to try to avoid if you can. But yeah, the reason why so many things like that happen is just because the producers are trying to get the funding however they can, so they can make this film. And I would say in some cases, having more, a bigger investment is even scarier because with a bigger investment, 
at least from what I've seen of the bigger movies, bigger investors tend to expect bigger profits as well, sometimes depending on the film. And so when it's when it barely breaks even, these major these major companies, even when they make a bunch, even when they make more than their money back, even after distribution, they still make more. The fact that they didn't make what they were hoping or expecting to make can are, can already doom that film. Right. So that's a, a lot more pressure on a film. Another thing that can change the money is some major stars in your film or maybe you have a major producer or director or cinematographer less likely a cinematographer but but directors producers and actors um if they are they are well known and are going to really sell this film if their name's attached they could sometimes demand a percentage of the gross income rather than the net income um which would all very much drastically change the amount of money coming down the ladder. And the thing about that, how some of the actors and stuff get screwed over is they say, yeah, we want a percentage of gross income. Well, if you look at the list, there's gross income to the distributor. There's the theatricals gross income the, the from ticket sales. There's the sales agents gross income. Then there's producers gross income. So which, which part of that gross income are you taking out? Are you talking about the producer's gross in income? And that is where they typically don't really, some of them don't think about it and they just say gross income or whatever. And then the contract, they say, okay, fine, producer's gross income. So now it's like, it goes down all these steps and it gets to this part. And that's still a lot less than it was at the beginning. And so the actor might've thought that they were gonna make a lot more money than they do because they're getting it from a further step down. Some un actors that don't know, they, they might do net profit. And um, that usually doesn't really get them anything. And I'll talk about that. Like I said, I'll, I'll get into that in a little bit. I think I have it in, later in my notes, but that's the reason why you have some actors that say, all right, I want a percentage of ticket sales. I want a percentage of I think what, who did it recently? I said she got screwed over from uh, Disney. Oh, really? Scarlett Johansson. For Black Widow, she said, yeah. I want a percentage of mm -hmm. the ticket sales, but then they showed it in, um, they they showed it on it Disney Plus on and the theaters at, at the same time. So the Which money she thought she contract. was gonna make from it because she thought it was gonna be only in theaters, that wasn't in the contract. So they just ended up putting it on both. And she, that did take away some of her profits because of that. So, and I get, yeah, so that they could make more money on streaming and wouldn't have to give her since her contract specifically only talked about ticket sales. Oh, that's kind of tricky. Mm, it's yeah, very yeah, it is. It's very, it like but that is why there's accounting tricks to this stuff and why you have to be very, people in the know are very particular and very careful with their wording to make sure that they are getting the exact part of the money that they are talking about because it's going to be handed down and go through so many steps even major films it goes through studios and has all of this stuff um so it doesn't it, for independent films it's not as big of a thing it just has less money coming down at the bottom but for major feature films and stuff that are making millions and hundreds of millions and billions of dollars they uh do a bunch of accounting tricks to to try to get the littlest amount of possible to pay out to the, the people at the bottom, depending on the I company. I feel like depending on like the people, some people will do that and some people won't. But it's right. good to be but it's it's good to be aware of these things or having like some like form of like experience to how things can go wrong. To so want to really appreciate when things are going well. Um, and people are actually being super fair without you even having to fight. They're just like, yeah, no, it's done and covered. That is like the best, like and you're just like, wow, then you're not even like, you know what I mean? Like if you work with yeah. somebody all the time, this is, you know, wherever you are in the, in the film system, you work with somebody all the time, you have like this great deal that you're pretty happy with. Um, and it's like rinse, repeat, right? So uh, yeah, so those are those, those, those things to, to think about too. Um, yeah. Yeah, there's good companies and bad companies, but there's definitely stuff you want to watch out for and, and keep Oh yeah, it's good to know because you yeah. might work with somebody new that's different. Right. Sure. Yeah. All right. So um, another thing to know is that some 
sometimes you'll see a film that is on a budget of like $30 million. And so you think that they need to make back $30 million to break even. Um, and because of the way this is, like even some independent films are made for that much now. So because of the way this whole thing works, if the cost of the budget, which comes out of that producer's gross income down at the second to the bottom, mm -hmm. they need to make more than 30 million at the box office and through all other distribution methods so that by the time it gets down to them, they yeah. can pay off the $30 million budget um, to the investors and whoever else put in money so that uh, they can, that's how they make the money. So it's not just $30 million at the box office means that $30 million film is good to go. It's more like they need to make a lot more than that to be able to break even because of the way it is, um, the water, the way the waterfall works. Also, another thing to keep in mind is that um, some f funding may have been provided with either tax incentives <sighs> or rebates. So that means a $30, $30 million film might need a lot less than 30 million to break even and ensure investors are fully repaid because they might have had a tax rebate coming in that is 30% of the entire uh, budget. You know, depending on where they are, there's a lot of good at tax incentives. And if you look at this list, you can kind of see why. There's going to be tax taken out at every level and it's going to generate a lot of tax revenue. And so they're willing to give the bottom um, some tax incentives in the beginning so they can create that film so that they can then get some sales tax from the theaters and from other places and from DVD sales and video on demand and all of that because they're going to make a lot of taxes off the top end and then the distributors company and the sales agents company is going to also pay taxes as well as the producer at the bottom in the end. So Makes sense. that's why. And then also, you know, then beyond that, it also is like Priscilla was saying, I think last semester when we were talking about financing, mm -hmm. or it was the semester before that. Either way, um, it also brings in like tourism and people to come to that place to see it. Like New Zealand, when they had Lord of the Rings, a lot of people saw how pretty it was and wanted to go there because of the movie. And so it brought a lot of tourism in and they kept one of the sets up for I think Hobbiton or whatever to get people to go in and, and see it, to have an attraction. So that's another reason they do it, tax incentives and things like that in certain places. But uh, a, lot of that too. a lot of people work in a lot of things, like in a lot of stuff. It's like it's huge. Mm -hmm. like on the stuff, yeah, well, once you reach theaters and stuff, you, you already, you're huge. Like there's so much, yeah. It's very, right. very, very cool. All right. So in this graphic, he places some numbers in the example to show how it works. Um, do other could be merchandising movie tie-ins oh yeah that's right you could have like you know mcdonald's sometimes does toys and stuff with movies um or other movie tie-ins with like doritos and mountain dew do it sometimes with games and movies or you could do novels soundtrack sales things like that those kind of types of things can come from the other uh tab or where the other revenue Typically speaking, if a film is successful in the theaters, that is where they're going to make the most money. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it's sort of changing somewhat now because of video on demand services like Netflix buying a film entirely. But for an independent film that's not very big, most of the time they're going to make their most money from either um, from free video on demand with advertising or a mixture of video on demand, other and home entertainment stuff. Because typically like a small independent film is either not gonna make it to theaters or they're not gonna do too well in theaters. Whereas a bigger independent film, the one that's on this screen, $30 million one, obviously they can hire some big actors that's gonna bring in some audiences into the theaters. And so that if they are successful there is where they're gonna make the most money. And then they're gonna make money from all these other places as well. All right, so theater, they say, you know, um, they say this movie grossed $75 million worldwide. 
in the box office, mm -hmm. in the theater. And so the theater ends up having about 34425000 because the theater itself is going to take its cut. And so this is the money that's being passed down. And then they say in home entertainment made about 18 million, television 28 million, video on demand 8.5 million, and other 3 million, giving it a total income revenue of $91 million. And that mm -hmm. sounds like a huge amount of money. But then he breaks it down into all right, total received 91 million minus the print and ads advertising costs. So minus about 35 million, you know. Some budgets for, for marketing can be half, 50% to 100% of the actual production budget. So mm -hmm. saying that it's $35 million for a $30 million film isn't that unrealistic. And so now already we have 56 million left. Now the distributor's taking out their fees. They take out a percentage of whatever they had. He's putting the number at like 15 something million dollars. So now there's 41 million left. Sales agent takes out about $100,000, and then the sales agent's fee, $7,800,000, and then minus the original budget, which was $30 million, going back to the investors. All that's left is $3,578,000 out of that $91 million. And now that, that gets broken down again, and you can see at the bottom, investors profit over to the left, producer's profit over to the right, mm -hmm. producer's pool. And so if you have multiple producers with certain agreements in their contract for a percentage of net profits, that is where it comes out of. If you have any actors, crew that have some kind of net profit deal, it's gonna come out of this producer's pool on the bottom. So you say like, oh, I'm gonna have 1% of the net profits. You're thinking that's gonna be, you know, $900,000 because it did 90 million. No, it's going to be 1% out of the 1 million. And so it'll still be, you know, a decent chunk of change, like 10, what is that, 10,000? Like 10,000, $17,000, but it's nowhere near as much as you originally thought. And that's where a lot of people that are new but are getting a bigger name sign a bad deal because they think it's worth 900,000 or more because they're like, oh, they're saying the film's going to be, you know, it's going to do a hundred million dollars in revenue, but they're, they're doing a deal for the net profits. A percentage of the net profits is going to be a lot less than, than the gross profits, which would be up at the top. This 90, uh, they negotiated like 1%. What's that? So they negotiated 1%, which is like 1700 bucks. Yeah. If they negotiated 1%, some can do less, more, it depends. But if you're doing gross, uh, it just depends how big your name is, how successful the film is because of you compared to like, I don't know how much pull you have pretty much, yeah. but it could be any number. Honestly, I was just putting 1% as a, as a thing, but then, so the other, the investors also for investors, they think they're going to get a huge profit, but they put in $30 million and after the film made $91 million, they only get, they get back what they put in, which is good, but then they only get a profit of 1 million and what, like almost $1.8 million profit. That's only like 6% gains. So like yeah, a 106% return for the film industry. That's considered good because it's like, Oh, we turned a profit, <laughs> but for an investor, that's a pretty bad amount. Uh, for the risk and time they put in for that single investment because you got to think the, yeah. the budget was there with them for a few years at least to make that film and so typically if you're looking at any other type of investing you would make a bigger profit back than you would doing the why, film you know on these things it's so timely too right because if an investor's there and like you film the whole movie in a year and they're like okay that wasn't so like because like now the years drag on that 30 million dollars would be making more money in the bank like i get it Online. Right, exactly. And so that's why, you know, that's why they always say be honest with your investors, because this is a movie that was successful. It made three times as much of its budget in all of its revenue streams, but it still isn't giving like a great amount of money. It's still like, it's a good amount. If you're the only producer, if you have two people, then yeah, you just made about, you know, $800,000. But if you have 
you know, 30 different investors, then you're not going to be giving them very much money. You're going to pay them back at least, but you're not going to be giving them too much on top of that based on uh, if these numbers were real. So, and a lot of films don't make money back. They don't break even even. So even at the box office, even if through their revenue stream. So there's no way they break even all the way down at the bottom. So you got to think about all that when you're an independent filmmaker, because that is why it is hard for an independent filmmaker to actually make money and why most films don't make their budget back. And most films fail because like, you're not obviously like if you want a success in any business, it comes down to number and where yeah. you're putting everything in. Yeah. And like, yeah, pretty much. Right. And so this is why investing in film is one of the riskiest investments someone can make. If it is successful, even if it is successful, it doesn't guarantee that they're going to make their money back or that they're going to even turn a profit. Also in this, uh, in his website, he points out that if an actor agreed to about 5% of the profits, then they only get 90,000 on top of their upfront fee if we're going out of the net profits. So it's kind of like the example I gave with the 1%, but he was saying if they did 5%, if they're not thinking about net compared to gross, uh, they're, they're going to be disappointed with the amount that comes in compared to what they thought they were getting from it. So sometimes the deals for profit sharing aren't as lucrative as they may seem at first. He also says, even though this is complicated enough, a real waterfall won't be as neat as his because some things that can complicate it further are each country the film is distributed in will likely have different tax rates and rules. Each distributor may have unique terms to their contracts and other things like interest rates, if there's any currency fluctuations. So if you are distributing overseas, like if you were recently having a film and you were getting a lot of money coming in from Russia and now that you know, when Russia attacked Ukraine and everybody started blocking business from them, their, um, the Russian ruble tanked. The, the amount it was worth to the world was nowhere near as much as it was worth before that. And so if you had a film that was being pretty successful there and you were making what seemed to be a lot of money, by the time you actually get it to the U.S. and convert it, it wouldn't be worth too much right now. So. Those are other problems. And usually it's not that drastic. Usually there's not that big of a crazy uh, amount of like a financial thing that, that just falls flat like that. But there can be small fluctuations that really impact a huge amount of money. Um, if the US dollar becomes worth more than other currencies and you're making international money a lot, then it's not gonna be worth as much once you get it to the like, United States, if you are in the United States, because by the time you convert it to the dollar, it's worth more and you're going to get less dollars for the other currency. And so those are all like just little things that can complicate this kind of waterfall even further. Um, now, here's the question. What happens if a film fails? What was that? What if you make a film and it epically fails? Then you never can pay your investors back. Your distributor probably won't recoup their costs. Sales agents won't recoup their costs. Um, and you're not gonna recoup any pocket money you gave out. Everybody's just gonna be on the losing end of that when, uh, when, a, film, when a film bombs like that. And some very big budget films bomb like that. And so everybody that was involved just kind of loses uh, and they don't they don't see their money return to them and, uh, and that would make it obviously harder to make more deals so that's the one thing no matter where the money goes you want to avoid that at all costs in my opinion like no matter how like even if you get the short end of the stick that's the worst case scenario yeah and that in is why opinion. also everybody mm -hmm. recommends like um, I think even you recommended this when we were talking about financing and stuff back in last semester like don't do the budget over what it's going to be sellable for because you're not going to ever get your money back. And it's better to make a smaller film 
a smaller budgeted film that mm -hmm. is semi successful or breaks even at least compared to making a larger budget film that looks better but doesn't perform well or doesn't meet its budget back yeah. because then you're going to be having a harder time making another project after that exactly yeah it, it, you again like those not always start small start with nothing and then build up like 20 bucks and then see just like for fun i mean like while you're doing other stuff and learning or loan under somebody else like second right so if you're like um there's lots of different ways and tactics you can do it but yeah i mean that's you know i don't suggest being like hey i got a bunch of money let's just make a movie probably not the best best plan <laughs> right so try it small first like build build it test you know test things out um before it's the same thing like if you break down any any area like you're gonna test each section out before like your final cut like you have a script let's test the script um mm -hmm. don't just be like this is the script we're making no changes that's not gonna work like yeah so right. there's lots of things yeah and i yeah. feel like it all like it, almost is the same formula for success like rinse repeat almost with some adjustment to right. every level and area if that makes any sense yeah all right so um the other stuff that might affect the the overall money is sales tax, of course, which is going to vary state by state and country by country. And if you want to read more about some of those, he actually lists that in his website about this topic. Um, some countries have a much larger sales tax for for entertainment than they do for anything else. And so if there's an or for international things, they do more sales tax on, of course. Um, so you might end up getting 50% less just because the sales tax is taken out and then the theater takes out as well. So you might end up making 25, 30% of the money from that ticket sale because of sales tax and the theater in that country. So it, that all varies very much. And then of course, there's this, the amount the cinema keeps, the cinema itself, it's gonna keep a chunk and that's gonna be based on whatever agreement the distributor was able to make with them to get them to show the movie in the theaters and smaller smaller films aren't going to have as much leverage because not as many people are going to know about it and want to go see it and so the theater doesn't really care as much about getting it in their theater um so they're not going to give us good of a deal they're going to say okay we'll show it but you have to give us this amount of the ticket sales and so it'll be a lot more than it would be for a blockbuster large triple a Hollywood film, you know, obviously. Yeah, I guess, yeah, it depends, like, too, like, again, if you're small and you're trying to get into theaters and build your brand, I mean, you're going to make more concessions while you're building building your brand, because obviously you want to end up becoming bigger so that the theaters want to have your movies in there. I mean, like, oftentimes, sometimes people are just, are just doing things for, like, a one-time, like, we made a movie, and sometimes people actually have, like, bigger business plans of, like, network streaming, like, consistent. Uh, and future projects making yeah, exactly. everything. Yeah, exactly. Right. Really so according to uh, what Stephen follows, his info and his sources that he got, typically a box office revenue will work on a split where income from the ticket sales is split between the cinema and the distributor after taxes are taken out. Other cinemas might do um, something, a deal where it's like first, the first dollar amount, whatever dollar amount you want to put there, goes to the cinema and then the tickets are split after that. Obviously, that's a worse deal for the filmmaker, uh, but if that's all you can get, you might want to go with it because if your film's successful, they'll reach their dollar amount and then you'll get split after that. They might even have a better split percentage than they would if they just did a split from the start because they're making the first however much amount of money that comes in from it, um, from the first amount of ticket sales. Another way a cinema might do it is they pay a fixed fee to show the film and they keep all of the ticket sale revenue and that independent films especially will go through one of those three but bigger films most of the time and even with independent films most of the time it's going to be a split where taxes are taken out and then the revenue is split between the cinema and the distributor in some way Makes sense. um but yeah, yeah some, some independent films could get a cinema that wants to just pay, okay, we'll pay you this amount of money and then we get to show your film and that's it. Like it's a fixed fee that we're paying you and then you don't get any revenue from the ticket sales. Others say, all right, we don't really trust in your film. 
Uh, it doesn't seem like it's going to make any money, but if it does, we get the first $5,000. After that, we split it 70-30 or 60-40 or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I mean, it comes down to, to like a good team and stuff too. There's like lots of things that go into everything, so. Oh yeah, there's so many different deals that go into this, which is why it, it really depends on what the percentages are and how they take out their profits. And maybe they work out a deal where the cinema takes out before sales tax is considered. And so, you know, then obviously they're taking out more money. And so there's a bunch of different deals, which is why you want to make sure you get a good distributor that knows what they're doing and has good connections so that they can. Uh, and, and that's usually why you want to split your, your rights, your theatrical rights and your video on demand rights so that there's different distributors doing those things because some will be better at one than the other and they can get yeah. better deals because they work Nobody in, in this more often. business is going to be good at all areas like this in, in, in conceivable like it's huge like i mean you right. might have like a general knowledge and you know overlay in areas like if you're like accounting you know mm -hmm. that's going to be an easy overlay to anything and find it anything you know like so it depends like what your area of expertise is and where the like um overlay is it's interesting yeah because like, they're dealing with that kind of stuff all the time so it's like yeah. yeah and everybody's going to have a very specific thing that they're the best at and then they're going to have other things that they're good at but they're you know kind of on par with other companies and other people and other things like that so um it can get very selective and very uh you can get very specialized very quickly if you want to specialize in something or if the company wants to specialize in one thing they they can definitely do it because there's so many avenues to take exactly. the longer a film yeah. stays in a theater the more the split of the ticket sales begins favoring the theater and that that keeps a theater wanting to keep a film in longer usually because now they're getting more of the money um according to stephen <clears throat> stephen follows only the largest movies claim more than 50 percent of the ticket sales he's talking about the uk though so i'm not sure how that correlates to the united states uh, i think i have notes later that talk about united states but uh, we'll get into that in a minute 55% split in the favor of the distributor is generally thought of as a good deal, a great deal. So it may be like a 55 to 45 split the first week or the first two weeks. And then it goes to a 50-50 split for week three. And then it goes to a 45 to the filmmaker, 55 to the distributor, I mean the cinema week four. And then a 30-70 split for the final weeks where 70% is going to the um, theater. So as you can see, like as time goes on, it starts favoring the theater more and more. It might start at like 55-45 where the filmmaker or the distributor is making more money at first, but then it starts leaning more towards the theater as weeks and weeks go on, mm -hmm. which is why you'll hear box office weekend, you know, the the premiere and the weekend the first weekend the movie's out is the biggest deal for the film itself because that's where that that's when they're making the most money that makes sense yeah it, it also like points film. out that this is just an example for an independent film studio films are typically distributed by the studio's own distribution operations in practice the studio charges themselves fees because Studio distribution companies are often legally separate entities to comply with antitrust laws and to reduce the official profit, thereby reducing the amounts they have to pay to people with profit shares. So that's one way that they can, that's one way that they can do it. They have a distribution company and they have a, a um, producing company and they're under the same umbrella, but they're legally separate entities and the producing company is going, the distribution company is going to charge this amount to the producing company, but, but they're charging themselves because they're the same, comp, they're under the same umbrella. <clears throat> so they're kind of overinflating the cost of the distribution. But of course, the producing side is going to agree to it because again, it's the same thing. It's the same company. And that way, less money gets to that bottom. And that's why a lot of people will never see those net income from, uh, I mean, any income from net profits shares. That's not good. Yeah. You know, like, yeah. 
yeah, it's it's scummy, but that's the way that's the way they usually do it with that, which is why a lot of the bigger actors and and uh, named crew will ask for gross profit shares if they want a profit share at all. Gross profit shares. Let me even make a note of that. That makes sense. Um, I mean, I get it. Like, if you're just a crew, uh, like. I say just a crew member, but you're not just a crew member, but like if like that's what you're doing, like your contract worker, most of the crew's contract workers, it's a little bit different. But if you're on the autistic side and you're taking some risk or or investing a lot of yourself, then it's like it's kind of scummy to like, you know, rip off their fair share. I mean, like yeah. yeah. So I mean just to, to But it know, happens. Yeah, yeah, it does. Yeah. And you try to avoid it as best as you <laughs> can and like avoid as much scumbag kind of like they will, and then here's that Otis. They might not work with your company again, and they might go work with like somebody that you're like, um, have like a, like the uh, what's it called? Um, uh, another company, the uh, competition. Yeah, the competition, like the good job, and then. So, I yeah, mean, like, and so that's why it's always good to. That's why it's good to know about these things, so that you can kind of when you're making a contract, it's all about the way it's worded and and how it's worded is going to really affect. And, what you are trying to go for which is why an entertainment lawyer always comes in handy if you can get one because they'll be able to say well you know you're talking about this step when you want to be talking about this step and they'll be able to tell you if that's a realistic goal or if it's realistic or not for a distributor to even accept that kind of deal and all these other pieces of information that it's kind of hard to figure out all on your own yeah and i mean like unless you're like you know like really 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 scummy and stuff like that if i if i'm like in a position where i have all of the information and all of the money and i write a deal that's like pretty scummy i mean like you would also think that other people in the industry uh, who are on par with me would be like yo buddy that's pretty scum mm-hmm. so it's like there's a lot of like you know that they're too. all making profit so they like it too <laughs> well, yeah, which but, sucks I mean, like, but, but that's just the way it is um not saying that it's okay i'm just saying like it's just that's how it works because they are making money as well so they don't really care to be like hey stop that because they want to make the money and so it's all just kind of done on purpose which is why you want to be able to weave your way around these things but anyway well sometimes you can and like that's not a good scene and that's when you can have like a huge flop and things go wrong yeah it's just not good Mm-hmm. all right so um moviecultist.com letter j they say that u.s theaters take about 40 percent for the first week or two so that would be about 60 percent to the studio or distributor in the united states um whereas the other guy was saying united the was saying for the uk it's about 50 50 or 55 45 here it can sometimes be about 60 40 in the distributor's favor and it depends on the size of the film, of course. Not every, not every film or distributor is going to be able to get that kind of deal. But for the bigger ones, you can get something like that for the first few weeks. And then it starts to, no matter what, wherever you are, the longer it stays in the theater, the better the deal is going to become for the theater as time goes on. All right, this next stuff comes from K, the Gorilla Rep dot com indie film distribution payment waterfalls 101 filmmakers are the last to be paid investors have to make their money back first before filmmakers see any money from their profits so if you or any other crew are working 100 percent deferred then you get paid last what does 100 percent deferred mean so deferred payment means I'll pay you when we make money. Um, and a lot, of, a lot of small independent films do that on purpose. They just need to know what that means. Um, that's basically having people work for free because as you can see, not much money makes it down to the bottom. So instead of, the, instead of you paying somebody up front, you have an agreement with them. Maybe it's someone you know. Um, or maybe it's somebody that just really likes the idea of your film. So they will be willing to um, work for deferred payment, which just means like once, once the money comes down the, the line, then you get paid this amount. So if you're working for $200 a day and you work 10 days, you're owed $2,000, 
you're not going to make that until the money makes it down to the producer's pool and then it's going to be given to you. So some, some independent films do this and independent projects and it's not like it's bad. It's just that they need to know what this means. It doesn't mean everybody gets paid automatically. It means that if the money comes down the ladder and makes it all the way to the bottom, then you're going to get the, the, your share out of that money. Yeah, and that's the, you're right. There is a lot of like shady tricks that you can do. Like if people really want to screw you, they can. And that's like the scariest thing about this business and why like unions and things are there to like protect um, you know, workers and everything else. Cause like you can like, especially on big budgets and stuff, cause people can do all sorts of really, really, really horrible and shady things if they want to. So. Right. Which is why you got to watch out. And, and, but even if you do, that's my point is like, again, like if you're dealing with like something that, you know, you're doing everything that you possibly can to like, make sure that you've read all the paperwork, understood, you got an entertainment law, you've done all, you crossed your T's, you've dried your eyes. You know, if somebody really wanted to, for whatever reason, they can still like, you know, people who are above you can still like, it'll be harder, but if they want to do, they can. Like, Especially on small films, which is also a problem with independent filmmaking because they can just not pay you and it's not worth it to try to legally battle them for it because at that point you're just paying more than what you would have made. And so, yeah, if somebody really wants to screw you over, they can. And that's why. And that's why you just, what I would do is you just don't like, uh, if, if that happens in an indie, you just don't work with them again and you go and work with, you know, uh, and you just kind of like X them. You'd be like, okay, hey, these person like really did a doty. On yeah. Our and you just tell everyone, you know, to watch out for them because that's all you really can do. Like you said, like you can't really do anything after that point, even though you'd like to, it's just not going to be worth it to try to hire a lawyer or something to go after that's them why also be very careful about what you say about any of your friends too because like you don't want to accidentally like be in a tizzy and like it gives like accidentally say something and like have somebody like take offense to that's like a really hard one that i'm learning it's like yeah because you, you don't want to accidentally ever like if you really like working with your crew and everything's going really well you want to be sure that you're always saying as much good things as you can it can be hard too because like emotions fly and things go left, right, and center. That's just something that I've learned that matter a lot more in this business than it does in, say, other business that I've been in. Like, because mm -hmm. I was in construction business, it's just, it's a little different mm -hmm. how things are going. Like, it matters, but it's like, it's it's just done differently. Um, yeah. So that's just something that I have learned is very finicky with people. It's like, yeah. it, or like, even you mean all well and they just read you wrong. And it's like, yeah. It was, yeah, it's kind of like, it, yeah, can be finicky for that, so. Um, yeah. And then that can There's, cause like a, a, an argument or something and, and a reason for like fallouts. And that's where you start getting people doing shady things when emotions get involved. So I say try to be as like professional and business front as you possibly can and things will go wrong and just adjust. Yeah. Right. So and again, and if you try you really to let things go, if, if it, you know, if you do end up getting in something like that and you did everything you could to, to avoid it, just kind of try to let it go. Uh, exactly. Instead and of holding a grudge and being like, mad. But you can let, you can warn other people, but just, you know, try to try to don't let don't hold on to it and be angry about it for the rest of the time that you're in film and don't let it affect your future dealings let you be cautious about stuff but don't let it affect but don't mistake too like if 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 what like that's the other thing too uh, make sure that you're getting the right person that like did the dirty mm -hmm. right like you wouldn't want to accidentally like blame somebody who didn't do the dirty and you hurt though you know what i mean so it's just like yeah it can be tricky and finicky for that reason too. Like, um, cause sometimes you won't know. Yeah. It's not like, yeah. So, and then that you just have to let go and be blind, which just sucks. And then, yeah. And then if you really like working with people, let them know because that, that matters when you find like good people and you like get chances to like, and people love you out working, you're doing really well. Like don't take it for granted. It's wicked. Right. All right. So that is if you do deferred payment, that is how that works for anybody. Sometimes if you, you can do deals where it's a percentage of deferred payment and it would still work the same way, they would get paid whatever you say to get paid up front. And then if they, if any money comes down the waterfall or the ladder, however you want to say it, gets down to the bottom into that producer's pool area, you can then distribute that money out to the people to pay them the rest of the way for the rest of their payment. However, if you did any kind of salary or pay for yourself or for others, which, you know, if you're the crew all wanted pay right up front, a lot do, and it's, you know, totally reasonable because they're doing work, so they should get paid um, if you can afford it. 
then of course you they're already going to be paid before any of these steps happen that's going to come out of the budget out of the investors money really so if you're the filmmaker and you have a producer's fee for yourself you can do that it's just going to be coming out of that budget of the producers of the in investors money uh, and then if you they make extra on top of that that's where you can get some of that extra money from the bottom uh, if it gets to the net profits later on what i found to be good news from these examples later in his site is that the fees aren't for the entirety of all gross revenue so like a distributor takes their percentage then passes it down and then the next party takes their percentage i i wasn't sure how exactly that would work with like a sales agent a producer's rep and a distributor if it would be them taking a percentage out of this bar this 91 million up top or if they take it down um, if they take out their percentage as it gets passed down and good news is they take it out as it's passed down the distributor takes out first and they might have a 30 percent deal where they're taking out their 30 percent and the producer rep might take out they might have a deal to, to get 10 percent and so if ten thousand dollars comes in from revenue instead of the distributor taking out 30 percent and they take out three thousand dollars now there's seven thousand left and then the producer rep takes out ten percent of that ten thousand dollars and it's six thousand left when it's passed down to you it goes in steps so it goes to the distributor first they take out their 30 percent fee and so now there's seven thousand left then they pass it down to the producer's rep which then takes out their ten percent of that seven thousand so they take out seven hundred dollars instead of a thousand and then 6,300 is passed down to you. And so if it's big amounts of money or if it's continuous amounts of money, it starts to add up over time because it's passed down in um, steps like that instead of everybody taken out from that top, which, which I wasn't exactly sure of. So that's, that is a good piece of news. And the lower you can try to make everybody's fees, the better because the more money is gonna end up coming down to the bottom, which is you. Also, if you have leverage, you may be able to negotiate a deal that the distributor, sales agent, and producer's rep take out their commission after they recoup their expenses. So what a lot of them do, which I think he kind of showed it a little wrong, <clears throat> typically they are going to the distributor, instead of recouping their costs and then taking out their fee, what a lot of them do is take out their fee and then take the rest out from the recouping their costs, their expenses. Yeah. And so that means less money's coming down at the, at the end. But if you have some leverage, you're able to tell them that they take out their percentage after the expenses are paid. That way, more money's coming down to the bottom. However, if you're new or you don't have any leverage, you'll have to normally accept that they take out commission before recouping their costs. According to Invest Investopedia, studio might get around 60% ticket sales for a larger film in the US and around 20 to 40% from overseas ticket sales. So even large films don't really make that much from theaters, from overseas anyway. So it depends, but ticket sales sound like it's fairly evenly split in the first week or two and then more and more percentage goes to the theaters over the following weeks. So if you're able to get it in theaters, uh, typically it's going to be pretty evenly split between the theater and the distributor to be then passed down the rest of the waterfall. All right, this stuff comes from the Motley Fool, which is letter A in the syllabus. Why box office results don't explain how much movies make. When you see a film's budget versus how much they make at the box office, they keep that whole waterfall in mind, or you should keep that whole waterfall in mind because also note that it's not uncommon for a film's marketing budget to be about another half of the production budget or sometimes double it depending on how much marketing is going into it. So a movie that costs 100 million for the budget may spend another 50 million on marketing, 
making the total actual budget 150 million. So if you ever go on Wikipedia, you're looking at how much a film costs, you're looking at the production budget, not the marketing budget. So you have to think about that too. If you see a film that was made for hundred million dollars on according to Wikipedia, you know, it says its budget's a hundred million. That's for the production budget. And then it probably has 50 million, maybe a hundred million for the marketing budget on top of that. So if a film makes a hundred million at the box office, some of that is gonna go to the theater, first of all. They say about 60% for the studio and for the first two weeks is common for larger films. So that is in line with what the other person said. So studio takes about 60%. So if they make 100 million, they're really only getting 60 million. Also 100 million minus sales tax. So whatever the sales tax is. They, uh, the Motley Fool, they say that typically a film hasn't broken even on its budget, its actual budget, which is the marketing budget and the production budget together until it's made about two times its production budget at the box office. So if it costs 100 million, it needs to make 200 million at the box office to actually break even because of everybody taking out their share and the marketing budget on top of the production budget. If a film doesn't reach two times its budget, it still has other ways to make up the differences and make a profit like streaming, video on demand, home video, free and paid TV, merch, and other things. But in general, a film, a big film like that will make the bulk of its revenue from a theater. Uh, not always, though. Maybe it goes directly to video on demand. It just depends now. But traditionally, theaters are where you make the money. So uh, that is something to, to keep in mind. Like theaters, when you're looking at movies, even big movies, they have to make a, a lot more money than they spent to actually break even. And then to make a profit on top of that, they have to make even more money. And then this is from letter C, Will Von Tegen, I think is how you say it. How do films make money? A look at theatrical distribution. He points out that even though we see a film's budget as 100 million, that film may have had pre-sales agreements, minimum guarantees, tax incentives and rebates, endorsements, and other things from brands in the film and more to where that 100 million budget may not have to actually make 100 million back in order to break even. Sales of costumes and props and things like that can also help bring in a bit of a recoupment for the cost. So that's also something to keep in mind. Uh, you know, if you do have a film, there are ways, if you do have a film that's worth $100 million, there are ways to get minimum guarantees and money right up front so that you don't end up having to make back the entire budget off of ticket sales, which would be then it wouldn't really need to make two times the amount of its ticket of its uh, production budget to break even. But uh, of course that goes from production to production. And so it may be different for each one. There's what's called Hollywood accounting because of how complex and difficult to follow this waterfall of revenue streams can be. There's a lot of different tricks that can go into it. Um, I'm gonna show that. All right, so there's a lot of different ways that they can trick the money. You already talked about one where they have a different company. Unfortunately, there are companies that purposefully do some accounting tricks so that they don't have to pay as much for any profit sharing agreements that they have. This is why most big stars go for gross revenue percentages instead of net profits, because they know they aren't likely to get anything from net profit sharing. And this is even when companies do legit accounting. Because of all the various deals and commissions, fees and expense recoupments, there's hardly ever anything left or very much left when the money gets down to the very bottom. This is from entertainment.howstuffworks.com, letter N. With Hollywood accounting, intentionally trying to make a film appear unprofitable 
Anyone who has a net profit share will never see a dime. Some of the tricks include studios setting up shell companies that are legally separate entities, charging exorbitant amounts for services so it appears that the shell company is paying the studio a lot in expenses when they are really just paying themselves. That's why for each film studio, they'll normally have, they'll normally create a, a new business for that movie. So you might have um, Paranormal Activity LLC, you know, some, some co company that's based specifically just for the film. And then you have the production company making it. So they're both legally the same company. The money's coming from the same place. The same company's putting the money in but they're treating it as two legally separate companies so they can charge themselves whatever amount they like. And they'll also like give people specific jobs for that specific film. For example, you're gonna run their website. You're going to take care of their social media posts because they, a lot of films and TV shows will create like an Instagram or a Twitter or something to help promote the show or the film. Um, they will basically like have a whole other department that's just in charge of working on that film. Right. And but to that, uh, but to go like with the Hollywood accounting, like the tricks that they're doing to try to get no money or to try to make this film unprofitable. Some executives also, um, they'll do that separate company thing. And then also sometimes in a company, some executives working in studios get bonuses and perks paid through some film or show which counts as an expense on the film or show's budget but it's really just going towards the executives uh and that could be for anything so, so it's like a right off <laughs> yeah basically a tax right off but they're doing it through the film so if the film's successful it still won't it'll have more costs than actually went into it because they're just giving money to their executives and it could be people that weren't even working on the film they just get oh yeah, I, I work at Disney. So we made Spider-Man and I might not have had anything to do with it, but my, my bonus came from Spider-Man for some reason, you know, whatever reason they put in, but it's like a, it's a little, it's a trick that they do to, to make sure that there's extra expenses on the movie to get us, to get it to be as least profitable on paper as possible. That's ridiculously stupid. Like, you know, you know what I mean? Like when you start doing stuff like that, like it's just like have some tact. That's all I can say. Like, yeah, know, it's it's you gross. have more reach and you have more power and you're like in a position, like it, it, it comes down to integrity and tact. Right. Definitely. And that's why like I don't I don't think companies should do this and I think it should be illegal, but they'd find legal loopholes to do it and so they'd this is how they do it. Yeah, but it's just me and it's just like, you don't even like, I wouldn't like, you know, and as I grow in my career and stuff, like I will not do that regardless. Like even if someone pisses me off, it's just like, look, it's a, people piss Sometimes off. they don't even think about it as like being mean or being like, they don't even think about the person at all. Sometimes they're just thinking- They're how just thinking about the money at the end. Yeah, that's all they yeah, think Yeah, about. you have to like get it. Like those in good integrity business cares about its people. It also cares about its money. Otherwise, it's not a business. I mean, yeah, like, but the higher you go, no. the less integrity there is. That's just the reality. Not necessarily. Typically, typically, yeah. Not all the time. Don't agree. Of course. How of course many companies of course, more, of often than not, more often than not, money will take precedent. Not just because the person well, is a bad person. Yeah. More often than not, it's just because there's so many people that are relying on you to pay this and pay that. And to get this ready and and oh we need these these numbers for this quarter and all this stuff and it becomes more about the pressure of delivering and profiting as much as possible than it does about oh like the discussion we had last week like yeah i would love for you know bigger theaters to get a bigger co production companies to give room for those productions to give their movies but at the end of the day when you're that high up you have so many people counting on you to make that money that you don't see the people you see. Okay, I need to make this much and that much. So pros and cons, like Coda said last week, at the end of the day, it's it's business and it sucks, but. No, I agree, but I would say like, um, I don't agree. Like at the further or the higher up I've gone on like any kind of businesses and things like that, the more, um, you know, um, reasonable, you know, things are, they do think about the people actually. 
I mean, not completely. Some of them do. Like, uh, like I'm saying, well, like, I'm yeah. not saying every company is evil and I'm not saying every CEO is evil, but they are, there are some that take advantage of the situation as best they can to try to do things. So in corporations in regular business, they use these types of tricks to try to hide losses. Sometimes some companies try to hide losses so that their shareholders and their stock price, um, the shareholders don't get concerned and the stock price doesn't fall. And in again, Hollywood, that's not necessarily- in Hollywood, it's the opposite. They're trying to hide profits so that they don't have to pay out as much to the people with profit shares. Okay, that's a little young. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like it's that's what I'm saying. Like it's it's the weird. companies that do this on purpose. It is a slimy business thing. It's why it's called Hollywood accounting. It's given a name, and that's given a name all over the board because it's so complicated. It's hard to keep up with, and there's a lot of loopholes that they can take advantage of. And they typically do if they are going to do that kind of business. So not every again, company, like the, not every company. About this is just, it's something to look out for, something to keep in mind. It happens. The main thing with all of this is just, if you get a deal for some kind of profit sharing agreement, check if it's net profits or check if it's um, gross profits. Because if it's gross profits, that's actually a pretty good deal. If it's net profits, it's a horrible deal and you're probably not going to get anything from it. So this is why films may be willing to give away what's called net points, but why actors, producers, directors, and others that know that these essentially mean nothing, they want gross points, gross profits, a cut of the gross profits, or even better, uh, what's called first gross dollar, first dollar gross, which is getting a cut of the gross profits from streaming purchases or ticket sales even before some of the other companies have recouped their expenses. So if, if somebody is a huge, if you could get a big named actor, actor like the largest, a triple uh, A-list actor, I mean, mm -hmm. on your independent film and they want first dollar gross, you're probably gonna give it to them because their name is going to sell and everybody else is gonna agree, yeah, that's probably a good deal. Um, for a certain percentage of the profits because they are the one who is going to get this movie seen and get it financed. Yeah. Um, and so that's why on some of these mega movies, they can also, depending on who they are and how long they've been in the business and how much leverage they have, they can also get some kind of agreement for first dollar gross percentage on their contract. And that way, any tickets that sell or any time it's sold to a streaming service, they get a percentage out of that money instead of getting it out of a later step in the uh, waterfall. Um, that makes sense. Yeah, being smart. Yeah, that's definitely a better way to do it. And like, again, like, yeah, it can be, but like you'll learn too. like if you have like a thing, you'll just, you know, you learn and you'll not work with certain people and you'll work with other people in life will. Um, yeah, but if you want to get one of these big deals, it's uh, that's where it starts being a, a, a pay attention to the things because that's when you want to make sure that it's a. Uh, and don't go along like favor. again, like if you want to do a big deal, like again, like I would say have like a mini thing too. Like I wouldn't, mm -hmm. everyone has their own like ways, right? So. Yeah. All right. So some examples according to the website, um, which is entertainment.howstuffworks.com. Some of examples, according to the site, of movies that are technically somehow in the red are Lord of the Rings trilogy. Even though it's made nearly $3 billion at the box office, it is somehow considered unprofitable on paper. Really? Yep. My Big Fat Greek Wedding cost $6 million to make, earned more than $350 million at the box office, and is said to have cost the studio $20 million in losses. See, this is what I mean. How do these people make money? <laughs> no, it, it's, yeah. it's, not, it's on paper it lost money, but really it didn't. That's, that's the whole thing. David oh, yeah, Prowse. Like, kind of like fake, yeah, like, yeah. Oh, oh, oh I understand now. now. Okay, like, God, yeah. that, that scared me for a minute because I was like, wait, on paper, do you mean like... Yeah, no, because it could have been, you know, Lord of the Rings... LLC charged. Yeah. This that's, so this is the YouTube comment that came that was on one of the videos I thought was pretty funny. 
Willie, Willie Olio, or however you say that. Warner Brothers. We made $1 billion on this film, Irish Warner Brothers Pencil Company, but we charge $1 billion per pencil rental. Warner Brothers. Oh man, we didn't make any movie on that film. Oh well. And that's kind of how it's set up. Like they charge however much they want for the distribution or the advertising or whatever from their own company that is just legally a separate company. And that way it looks on paper like the film never made money. David and that Prowse. Is legal. That is interesting. <laughs> David Prowse or Prowse, however you say it. He's the actor who played the body and the movements of Darth Vader in Star Wars. He's not the voice. That was uh, James Earl Jones. He's just the person who had the movements. He was in the actual suit. He actually owns a percentage of Return of the Jedi, which is the third one that came out. But because it's net points, so percentage of the net profits, he routinely receives letters explaining how the film can't give him anything because they still have not turned a profit. Oh. So. Yeah, that's just being, what's it called? You know, those are, those are, those, there are certain things and people in the world that just do things just for like, ah. to irk you or to like piss you off or to be like a dick. And I think- It was like, funny too, cause I was about to be like, oh, good for him. And then like, you said that and I was like, like, oh. Everything right, like it's just <laughs> shitty. Right. And that is why it's imperative that you look at the wording in the contracts anytime even you feel like then, you're having like, a good deal. Because these, uh, these companies, the big ones, the little ones, if there's bad companies all throughout and they can do accounting tricks to try to hide the profit. Like, yeah. I want to start what we're talking like, about is like, yeah. obviously things are going to happen. Uh, people are going to try to take advantage sometimes. What we're saying is what we can do our part so that we can at least say that we did our part and we did all we could so that if it does happen, it wasn't something we did and we're like, holy crap, I should have done this or holy crap, why didn't I do that? At the end of the yeah, day, guess, or, that's all we can really do. No, and I want to interject too, if it happens to you and you did as much as you possibly could with wherever you were at, don't blame yourself if somebody does you a dirty. I just want to put that out there because it's so easy to be like, oh yeah, you didn't read enough or like they got the wording wrong or like, you know what I mean? Like, yeah yeah if like somebody is doing a dirty they'll find a, like there's ways to find your weak spot or your blind spot so i mean if it ever happens to you don't blame yourself uh, um yeah because like that's just gonna be like feel bad because like you could read something over and think you're like checking things or like, doing that and, and like oftentimes like for me i work all the time i'm signing contracts left right and center um for a certain job and I, I skim read lots of stuff because it's always like- but the whole point in this is like okay. do not pay very much attention to this wording like yes sometimes you can do your best but in this case it's like this is the wording to look out for this is what to be careful it's mainly about profit sharing yeah. so if you have any kind of profit sharing agreement in your contract for any film or any project you're doing just make sure you yeah. understand what kind of profit first of all you're taking a percentage in if it's net profits you're likely to never see anything. Um, now, I just have one question, which I probably don't think you'll be able to answer me. I'm going to have to look that up later. With what? the whole Lord of the Rings thing, did they get... I'm going to look it up. I'm going to look it up after the meeting because now I'm curious to see how the whole distributing of payments happened in that process. So, yeah, if a Lord of the Rings, if one of the actors had a... Um, one of the actors that were signed onto the trilogy, if they had any kind of percentage net profit sharing they're not going to receive anything because technically even though it made three billion dollars at the box office as a trilogy mm. it is considered unprofitable on paper so and that is legal that is what yes is. and that's why it's crazy and so that's just some stuff to keep out an eye out for there's nothing you know you can't really do anything about it but you can make sure that if you are signing for a percentage of the profits go for gross pay profits go for gross that's, that's gotcha true. but like it's pretty like really it's that's really evil to do to somebody and just never work if that ever happens never work with them again and work with like the well the problem is lord of the rings was made by a huge company there's you know yeah. uh <laughs> there's sometimes they're so big disney screwed over um what's her name scarlett, scarlett johansson but she's not gonna just well, she might, but she's 
probably not going to just stop working on any of their films because they own literally everything. No, so even though they really. kind of screwed her on her deal, I mean, you know, I mean, you could unfortunately, there are some companies that are going to try to, if we think about it from a business, even though it is screwing you over from a business standpoint, they're going to try to get theirs and retain as much profit as possible. And in those cases with bigger companies, you have, you are going to have to fight for you and going to have to do your part to fight for yourself and just know that the higher you get it doesn't go away protecting yourself doesn't go away just because you are in oh now i'm working for warner now i'm working for disney no they can still do stuff like this and they have so at the end of the day you got to look out for you and you got to do your part as much as you can to take care of yourself and look out for for your best interest yeah. All right. So, so uh, technically speaking, up to eighty percent of all major movies lose money. So many of them are probably only losing money on paper, but re in reality, they've made a success. But there, of course, there's are legit movies that absolutely lose money and never actually make a profit. There's also the ones that quote unquote lose money and never profit. So note that these are for the larger companies, but it can also happen. Why It's also why you want to try to be clear in your contracts with any sales agents or distributors to try to get their fees low and make sure you cap their expenses in any contracts you have with them. Capping their expenses so that they don't do what some of these large studios are doing and create a shell company that's going to overinflate the expenses and charge their own company more than it's worth, which is why... Uh, when we were talking about it, when he was when when the people were talking about independent distributing, and when you're an independent trying to get distribution, cap their expenses because they might try to say that they need two hundred thousand dollars or more than the actual budget cost to do their um, advertising and stuff. And what they may be doing is just charging it to a, a, a legally separate company that is their own company. So they're actually still holding on to all the profits and they're keeping all of the, um, the money and they're just charging themselves. But then on paper for your contract, legally, they don't have to pay you anything because they have to recoup their expenses first, technically. And so that's some stuff to look out for on the independent side and why I brought this all up. Yeah, and there's, um, like, there's a whole bunch of other things that they can do. And I just, yeah. And my, my thinking is like, you know, if you ever get into like, you know, you have full faith and you do everything possible on your end and somebody just really does you a dirty, you don't have to stay and you don't have to work with them. Regardless, even if they're the biggest studio in the world. Like you well, at the end of the day, it's it's a lot, uh, that, that's what sucks. It's a lot harder said than done when it comes to bigger studios because you have contracts and you have like, oh, if, if you, unfortunately, there are people that are deemed difficult to work with because they, oh, they refuse to work with a company after they've had a bad experience and then that company will blacklist them. So unfortunately, it, it's already hard enough for people in this industry, but it people do get taken advantage of and it is something that is that really annoying. But, like, but at the end of the day, that's why you can't look at it as just passion. You have to look at it from a business standpoint. You have to look at it as I got to look out for me. I got to take care of my best interest. I got to constantly do my part. I can't just jump in with faith and believing everything's going to be all right. And they're a big company and big companies don't screw you over. They do everything by the numbers. Like that's, you know, unfortunately not a reality. So that's why it's so important for us as people who are passionate about film, who want to work in, 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 in this industry to always look at it from a business standpoint and not just the passion of it all because that is very important to keep that in mind yeah yeah and so i mean like you keep you out keep an eye out for all these I just things think you and... don't have to i mean like you can still work with them but i'm saying you don't have to if that ever i mean yeah it's really up to you know your personal business. no yeah i know i'm just saying it's not you as might end up doing something uh, completely depending on the size of the company unfortunately huh yeah, I know. I'm just saying yeah, that. Yeah, try to avoid it as best you can. Try right to not get into deal. a deal with it. But this is why it's important to research these companies before you get into dealings with them. If you're independent, then you're going to be working with independent distributors. You just want to look out for any mm, 
sketchy stuff, any kind of red flags like we talked about earlier this semester and make well, sure like you that... might have thought that somebody like screwed you and they didn't and you had a really good deal and everything was well. So that was another. Yeah, that was actually a oh, point actually, that somebody made that. about the actors that had a legit accounting uh, the, there was legit accounting, but because of the waterfall and the way it was working, um, because, you know, it goes through all these steps and you see like it's $91 million, but you're only giving me a thousand seven hundred. What's going on? And you said, oh, well, you only had a 0.1% of the profits. And like, yeah, but I thought that was going to be, you know, nine, $90,000 or whatever. And they're like, well, no, because it's actually out of this part of the profits, not out of this part. And so sometimes it's just because the person didn't know and they signed it and they're, even though it's legitimately coming down the way it should, and they're not doing any kind of accounting tricks, if you don't know that that's the case, you might end up making less than you thought, which is why it's just good to know that detail about net profits yeah, versus gross. If you had a really good experience and you made a little less than you thought, that's not really like dirty business. Right. That's just, exactly. that's, just, that's just good business going a little bit like not perfectly. And those are very big difference. What I'm talking about is like dirty business. Like if somebody like starts like, like, you know, there's dirty business and then those things just not going perfectly Um, in those ways. Like if in, in business, if somebody does something and it gets fixed or like things, the problem solved and they're like, okay, yeah. And you have, end up having a decent business relationship, then it's fine. I mean, like, it just depends. Like I would consider dirty business is if dirty business is when I, if I go out of my way to cause you hell grief and to rip you off just because i can that's what i would do yeah and at the end of the day we also have to think that not everyone that's, that's not the mentality that we're going into where the world yeah. isn't like that at the end of the day it's i'm looking out for me it's not i hate you and i'm evil and i'm going to screw you over it's i'm looking out for number one um but sorry yeah, i'm just so worried because it's like 12 and well that's fine like yeah, yeah that you expect yeah. that you expect people to, con to to look out for themselves. That's yeah. yeah. Um, anyway, honey, sorry. We should probably uh, continue because it's already twelve, and we've been. Yeah. So I'm gonna move on. Um, well, I'm gonna go over this real quick. I haven't really read over this, but I thought it was pretty cool. This is just showing kind of like how money flows through the industry and shows the biggest major studios and how much money they have made, how much revenue. Walt Disney, within the last fifteen years, has made the most with about twenty-four billion in gross revenue. Where Warner Brothers is right at its heel, at about twenty-three point nine billion. Warner Brother, uh, Walt Disney has made four hundred and twenty-three films. Warner Brothers four hundred and sixty-eight, and then you can see the rest of these major companies like Sony, Paramount Pictures, Twentieth Century Fox, their numbers, how much they've made in revenue. Um, Worldwide money spent on the film industry was $65 billion in a year. Distributors typically get over half, so about $35 billion goes to film distributors. Theater distribution, total revenue from US movie theater ticket sales. Uh, this is based on data from 2010. It is about six going up slightly to around $12 billion from 1995 to 2010 and it keeps going up of course with inflation and ticket price increasing but um, that price has been steadily rising over the years share of a theater box office revenue u.s exhibitors which is like theaters take about 45 to 55 percent of the revenue uk takes about 65 to 75 percent as a theater and elsewhere Elsewhere in the world, it's about 55 to 65%. Video and DVD distribution, percentage that film distributors get from consumers, about 75% of DVD or Blu-ray sales. So that's why studios are sometimes eager to get titles to the retail market because they get a big percentage of those sales. I wonder how different that would be now that DVDs aren't as big of a thing as they were. Like if that, if that percentage changed at all? I don't think the percentage would change, but the amount of money coming from it would change. But I, maybe, maybe not. Like maybe uh, they would redis redistribute because DVD isn't as big of a thing. Yeah, maybe. Pay-per-view and commission is about 25 to 35%. Subscription TV is about 25 to 35% in commission. And free TV takes about 25 to 50%. So that's the stuff with ad revenue. 
how actors get paid. Actors and actresses are paid by the studios that distribute the movies they were cast in. Depending on the film and their reputations, top actors averaged over $40 million per year. And this is from 2010. So, you know, like that's like 12 years ago now. So it's probably a lot higher. Yeah, but these um, are numbers too. This could be like not accurate as well. Honestly, the highest pay, yeah, that's true too. <laughs> it might not be exactly accurate as, uh, as it could be. Johnny Depp was the highest paid celebrity in 2010 with $75 million. Sandra Bullock was next with $56 million. Ben Stiller was next with $53 million. Tom Hank, Adam Sandler, Reese. And that obviously has something to do with the fact that the Pirates of the Caribbean franchise was the highest, uh, the more the most expensive and highest grossing film of that year, if I'm not mistaken. Because I remember that they said that it was like the most expensive to shoot and the one that got uh, the most revenue and that kind of thing at the time. Yeah. So, so yeah, I, I thought that was really interesting. I just wanted to show, kind of read over that. Um, but it just shows, and even now it's probably even higher, a lot higher than it was back then because it just keeps growing and more and more companies come out and more and more entertainment avenues appear. A lot of the stuff's now video on demand. So I don't think ticket revenue is as much as it used to be, but distributors are still making a, a lot of money because they're having the deals with the subscription companies and the um, the Tubi and Netflix and all these other streaming services to get the content onto their platforms. It would be very interesting to see a few years from now, once these streaming services have like stabilized and um, the world, you know, is a little more normal to compare to a few years ago, something like that and where it is distributed now. I feel like that would be really interesting. Yeah, if you can find the data. Yeah. Right <laughs> yeah. All right. So moving on from that, that was all talking about like how money is distributed in film. And like I said, the main thing that I wanted to point out was just net profits don't really mean anything. So uh, you don't really want to go for that if you're expecting money from it. You want to go for gross, gross profits. And then gross profits could mean gross profits of the producer, or it could mean first gross, which would be theater ticket sales and sales to Netflix or other streaming services and things like that. So there are different wordings for those as well to, to figure out what part of the waterfall you are grabbing your percentage from. And the other thing I wanted to point out on that all was just watch out for distributors that are trying to charge too much in expenses and advertising because typically if they're charging an exorbitant amount, they're, they're going to be charging it to themselves most likely. So you want to set a cap in the contract of how much they're allowed to spend on advertising for your project if you are working with a distributor because that way they don't, they don't do that sketchy business tactic. Uh, hopefully you get with a good distributor that doesn't do that stuff anyway. Always do your research and talk to people that have worked with them before to try to see if um, they do anything sketchy like, or if they pay on time and they pay what they're supposed to. But on top of that, just make sure that when you sign a contract with them, you make sure that you do not give them unlimited funding to do whatever they want with, because you'll never see a penny after that. All right. So now we're talking a little bit about some movie terminology and and theatrical release terminology. There's the ad budget, which is the same thing as the P&A budget, which is prints and advertising. Prints being the actual film back in the day when they had to actually like print it and uh, get the film stock to the theaters. Now it's di digital, digitally distributed, but it has to be on a um, digital cinema package. So it's like a hard drive of sorts that can run at fast speeds to play the film all of its data. So that's still, it's still, that term is still used. And advertising obviously is just advertising to whatever social media, YouTube, trailers on different sites and things like that. Award season. That's the window to release an Oscar film. It's usually does, um, oh, sorry, window to release an Oscar film is December 31st. That's when it ends. But award season itself lasts until Oscars are handed out in February to early March the following year. I don't know if we discussed this or not because um, I was 
you know, I'm, I'm listening, but sometimes I have to do something. Um, for award season is sometimes also added into the budget if you plan to apply, because for you to apply to be nominated, uh, for you to be nominated, you actually do have to apply and pay a fee. Yeah, that would, I don't think we talked about that, but that would, um, that that's for larger films, you know, obviously if they were trying to get an award, if they're trying to win an Oscar, then they will start, like, like Priscilla said, they start uh, putting some of that into the budget because they're going to be trying to expand the movie as far out as possible. Even if it's not as profitable, they're going to try to get it as well known as possible. So it has more likelihood of winning and they're going to try to do more marketing for it. And like she said, applying and stuff costs money. So there's a bunch of different things that go in if they're trying to do the, the film to try to win awards for it. This so even goes like, for small. Yeah, our company has this film that won a bunch of awards. So we have a great film under our belt. And this goes not just for Oscars, this goes for festivals, for smaller awards, for all sorts of things. And um, I'd also like to add, like Brian said earlier in the semester, um, the later in the year that a film is released is generally going to have it be fresher in everyone's minds. So if things come out in like January, people forget about it by the end of the year. And that's why the ones for the award season come out at a later point. Um, domestic box office. Obviously, that's the total money spent on tickets by moviegoers in the domestic market, which is if you live in the, um, if you live in North America, that would be United States, Canada, Puerto Rico, and Guam for the domestic box office. Home market, that's video on demand, rentals, or purchases of DVD and Blu-ray. So that's not theaters, that's talking about the home market, people watching it at home. And there's a tertiary market, which is like hotels and airlines. If you're selling the film to be able to be seen in an international flight, or you're selling it to a company that runs some hotels and they're gonna have it be one of the options. And that's the um, tertiary market. To answer V, I don't know if it's like all, every small festival, obviously, cause I don't, know about every small festival, but I do know that some smaller festivals, you will um, have to like apply for consideration. And there is like a small fee to put, to put, put your film up for consideration. I don't know if it's every single festival, but, but I do know that some smaller ones also. Oh, all festivals charge some fee to apply. It's kind of like in a, a college admission or something. No, to apply to the film, but I don't know if, if it's like for awards and stuff, you know? Oh, yeah, I'm not sure about that. Yeah. I'm sure every every festival is somewhat similar, but there's obviously going to be some differentiation between them because they're all different, run by different people. Um, there's this next term is called the Hulk effect. That's releasing footage, teasers, trailers, promotional photos, or anything that's not ready before they are ready. Oh my gosh, is that because um, is that because the actor of the Hulk spoiled a bunch of stuff? No, it's because in two thousand three, the Hulk shared special effects that weren't ready, which killed the buzz for the film and any chance mm -hmm. it might have had of being successful. They oh, showed wow. like the CGI before it was done, so everyone was just like, "This is awful." And but you I know, was nobody was really was excited to go see it because they thought it was ugly, even though it wasn't complete. They were just already in the mind, you know, even though they tried to spread it out later that. Well, they didn't put a statement that it was incomplete. Yeah, but that's like saying, hey, this is my this is my first draft of the script. What do you guys think? And if it's people that don't know movies, they're just going to think you have a crappy I mean, it script. Worked, it worked for the Sonic uh, situation after they got the feedback from the fans and they were like that's because they revamped it all and they made sure to put it back out there but yeah oh so you're saying they should have come that out that wasn't that they already had that done like that was finished and that was what they were going to go with with sonic oh. sonic was what they already that wasn't like before they made it that was oh, like no, no. no sorry what i mean is with the hulk it was before they were finished right so right. when they came out with the trailer wouldn't they be able to show people look it doesn't look like that for the people that go back to watch it sure oh, that's wait, the point wait, you're already losing people at that years point ago yeah it wasn't the social media place that it is now like the whole came out in 2000 
six. Uh, I don't remember something like that. Even if it was released now, if you showed something that was ugly, you're going to lose people from checking it out again. They might hear that the movie's good after it comes out and be like, what? I thought that movie was going to bomb. But they might not check back on it because they already saw first impressions are really important. So oh, if yeah, they see their but first I also... impression and they see that it's ugly, then they're going to be like, oh, this is cheaply made. And they might not ever pay attention to it again. No, the yeah, fans I, of the fans of Marvel and Hulk, you know, I'm sure they checked back and saw maybe that it was OK, but then the movie didn't turn out good anyway. But yeah, but I also feel like the fact that it was so early in the 2000s and Internet wasn't what it is now did contribute to it a lot, because now people don't even need to be looking for it. If it's trending, it's going to and you looked for it once or saw it once, it might appear the chances of it appearing in your timeline are a little larger not always but you know the chances of you seeing it again are larger now than it was back then so i feel like it contributed to it even even more yeah definitely yeah but i'm saying like it, it still affects things now you'll still lose some kind of customer base oh, yeah. whether you realize it or not i'm sure you're gonna lose people because not everyone's gonna check back on it but yeah so that's called the hulk effect if you release things too early that aren't ready um that is the a bad thing the next ter term is uh, internal multiplier, which is a film's weekend box office number divided by its Friday box office number. So it's to see how, how well it held, how strongly it held for the weekend compared to if it just had a really large premiere, because most films will premiere like on a, on a Friday and have a weekend, um, their, their first weekend, their premiere weekend. And uh, so they see like how how well is this held up to the first day that it came out or was it just like everyone went to see it and then nobody cares because it was just the fans that went to see it and uh and now it's not doing as well international box office that's total box office from all nations outside of the domestic market so wherever you are you're gonna have a domestic market with the country surrounding you um or with your individual country, depending on where you are. And then everything else is gonna be considered international outside of that. Legs, if a movie has legs, how well, it's how well a film holds onto its box office day to day and week to week. Mendoza line, that's the point at which it no longer matters to theaters how good the reviews are because there's not enough profit. So the theaters will be looking to drop the movie because of that before word of mouth can have an effect to get people to come watch it. So if you're yeah. a Mendoza yeah. line, it just means yeah. people, you know, it's not doing well enough at the beginning. And it, even though it has great uh, critical acclaim, uh, the theaters don't care because they're not making money. And so even if that critical acclaim would have brought in a bunch of people to watch it, the theaters are already at the point where they just want to get rid of the film because it's not making the money at that point. Yeah, I mean, like, uh, I mean, your theater's going to know when to cut something and when to continue. And I mean, like, yes, you want, like, critical acclaim and you want, like, things to get sold and do really well and, and all these kinds of things. But, like, again, like, it is a business and profits matter. So I yeah. mean, if you're going to notice this is going to be a huge cost or like you're going to go in the negative, cutting it early is a smart thing to do before it causes a problem. I mean, exactly. that's what, like it's called, what's it called? Um, it's like, you know, bio. Oh, something's starting to die, cut off the dead skin before it can, you know, take over any more of the arm. It's like that, yeah. So it's just like mm -hmm. always knowing how to make the those calls and just because like something looks like, yeah, there's like, there's a lot to it. Yeah, so that's just called the Mendoza line. If you ever hear anybody say that, that just means uh, it's at the point where it doesn't matter what happens next. They want to get rid of it anyway, that kind of thing. Unless, you know, unless it really quickly changes, then they might uh, change their mind. But in, in, that, in the sense of where they get to the point where they don't care anymore, it's usually not going to matter if it looks like they might get more in the future. Because like you said, it's a business, they need to make money, so they'll drop it. All right, next term, multiplier. That's different from the internal multiplier, uh, where the internal multiplier is the film's box office number divided by the Friday box office number. The multiplier is the film's total box office 
divided by its opening weekend box office. Some films make more in their opening weekend than they do over their entire run of the film. So their multiplier would be really low. And some hold pretty strong or they don't have a really big opening weekend, but they build over time. Um, and so it just depends on what kind of film it is and word of mouth and how many fans it has, if it already has an established fan base, that kind of thing. P and A, prints and advertising. Prints being actual physical film stock or DCP for cinemas, advertising, videos, banner ads, posters, billboards, magazines, newspapers. Large films, it's not uncommon to have a PA budget of 100 million, mid level, 40 to 50 million. So they can have a very large marketing budget. Production budget, that's the development, pre production, principal photography, post production costs excluding distribution and marketing. So it's a different budget. It's for the actual film. The distribution and marketing has its own budget. In a smaller film, you need to include it in your initial budget because you're not gonna have a separate company doing that. So you wanna keep some to the side for that stuff to make sure you can distribute and market it correctly. But for a larger film, they're gonna have their own separate uh, budget for it. Sounds good. Yeah. Screens and screen count. That just means how many screens the theater has and how many screens the film is playing on in a theater. There's a term called fanboy or fangirl effect. It's also known as sequel effect, where it's a built in fan base because they are fans of whatever the product is or, they're, or they are fans of the previous film. These films tend to open very strongly, but do not have long legs. So they don't, they don't stay in theaters for a really long time because all of the fans went to see it right away, right when it came out. Theater count, how many theaters a film is shown in. Theater average, otherwise known as per theater average or PTA. It's the film's weekend box office divided by the number of theaters it's playing in. So it's basically averaging out how much did each of these theaters make if every single one of them made the same amount, which clearly that's not gonna happen, but it's just to get an average. Worldwide box office, that's both the international and domestic box office together. Winter season, that begins weekend after New Year's Day and goes to the end of February. Usually it's the worst season for new releases because holiday hits dominate the box office and Oscar contenders are spreading wider to try to get more uh, attention to their movies when they're trying to win the Oscars. So January and February are not seen as good times to release a movie. And that's usually why you'll see some stuff that's not very good coming out in those months. Spring. I would say not very good and also very lower budget. Yeah, because, because not, the studios don't want to put it. They they put all they put most of their money into the big what they think is going to be big. And that's the stuff they put out in the fall season or the holiday season, uh, where they are also trying to get Oscars and stuff. And so those films are still in the theaters usually and they're still going. And that's why these new releases, they don't have as much faith in, they don't put as much effort into and money because they don't believe in them as much. Um, and so they'll just release some stuff that's of, to yeah, them, I to also them saw, it's of lower quality. Because well, I also saw, like, it's not with me right now, but I remember I saw a list of like um, movies that released in January and February that were actually good or whatever. And there was actually quite a, a big list, but it was all low budget films. Right. I yeah, see. and that's because they could have something a little bit more of like an independent film that they picked up that they want to put out to the theaters, but they don't have as much faith. They don't want to put it up against the big named movies of the summer or the holiday season. So they, uh, they put it out during those times because there's not as much competition for, for like a good film, typically speaking. Spring season, it begins March and it goes until the end of April. Generally, it's a weak time for the box office. Summer season. It's been shifting around for uh, what's counted as in the summer season, but 
it's typically the last week of April can be considered the start of the blockbuster season or the summer. And it ends around Labor Day. And last in the last weeks of August are considered a dumping ground for whatever they don't have faith in they want to get rid of because they have contractual obligations to put the theater put the movie to theaters but uh they don't really believe in it they'll put it at the end of august after all of the bigger movies the high budget triple a movies that they put out came out during the summer when everyone was out of school and everything yeah sarah were you trying to say something um i was what was i gonna say sorry no that's okay um it doesn't really matter um just like there's yeah there's a lot that goes into you know all these kinds of things and like yeah if you it's so easy to get starstruck you know what i mean like oh well if we just need to have like um this award or this that'll make a business like that's not how business kind of works so like really understanding like the business side of things you'll actually probably have a more um successful movie because like yes mm -hmm. you want people to you when you're building a movie of course you're going to want stars and you're going to want names to bring people in but i mean there's a lot more like you know than just that so um well yes and no because when you're looking at distributors that is like the main thing that they talk about is like who's in your film um that's so what, star power what you do actually... but you don't want to overdo it for the budget or the size like say if you have a big film and you need like a call like a named actor or two you're going to want them but you're going to want to make sure that you're also not um uh what was I gonna say like if your budget size is too small to have like five named actors then you might like like there's like there's there's things that go into it right so you might have like oh this really new good actor to work with like a few uh, supporting roles or or to work with the same yeah role. but when we were talking about yeah. financing you'd be surprised at like how many okay we're going to put more into this actor because in the long run it'll get us more recognition and it'll get us more distribution so yeah it's it's one of those things that unfortunately you do need to juggle and you do need it's all about distribution that we went into a, a few weeks ago months but yeah <laughs> months ago. oh well we we talked a little bit about it the last few weeks as well but it, it's all blending together at this point all right so that's yeah. summer season summer season's considered a really good time to have a bunch of these different films because everyone's out of school they're on break um and so there's just more time and for people to, to go out to the movie theater. People are willing to go out more because it's warm weather. So they're more willing to go out and like, hey, let's go see a movie tonight. You know, so that's where all these, uh, some of the big ones come out. Then there's the fall season, which begins sometime in August to the end of October. It's generally considered a bad time to release films as school is starting back up for college students and families with children. And so there's not as much time for everybody to go to the movie theater. However, in October, that is where all of the, well, leading up to October, that is where you'll see all of the horror films come out, of course, because of um, Halloween. But, you know, that is a genre specific thing. So we're just talking about generalities of a movie in general. You don't really want to release it in this window. You, you do want to release it in this window if it's a horror film, because then it's gonna be leading up to Halloween and it might actually get more people looking at it because of that. And then there's what's known as holiday season. That's beginning of November and it goes to New Year's Day. It's the best time to release films and it's the heart of award season. So that's the time when they release some of their biggest films because everybody has Thanksgiving break, Christmas break, you know, schools have winter break. And so everybody is able to be off and go see these films. Everybody's together. And so these are activities they can go do. And uh, it's the end of the year. So it's the, the time when you are going to remember those movies the most, the freshest. It'll be the freshest in everyone's memory come award season when Oscars are given out and everything. So that's when the big studios and things will do some of their biggest films, summer and the holiday season right before the end of the year. These next uh, few terms come from tvtropes.org. Box office bomb. That's a production and marketing costs are greatly exceeding the gross revenues of the film. Less severely, you might have a box office flop, 
which just means it didn't do as well as was expected or it, it didn't come to its budget, but it's not as bad as a bomb. Box office is a place where tickets are sold for um, movies. Was obviously, it's just the place where you go to buy the tickets. Box office, smash hit, very successful film. Costs to make aren't nearly as much as the ticket sales and revenue that came in. Simultaneous release. That's a movie's release to streaming and theaters at the same time. Traditionally, there's a window of time where the film is only at the theaters, and after that, it gets distributed in several other ways. But more recently, we're seeing, even with bigger companies, they are doing a simultaneous release or releasing straight to streaming services. That has a big part to do with the theaters taking like 50% of the profits, so they just see that maybe it's more lucrative, even though they'll get less money overall, it still might be more lucrative for the company to just distribute it straight to their streaming service, which is why we're starting to see some of that. Because then you would cut off, cut off the middleman, so to speak. Right. Sleeper hit. That's a film that has unexpected success upon release. That could be a January or February film that did really well. It's one of those films that they weren't expecting to do well that did. Or the end of August, that's considered a dumping ground for films. Uh, if those do really well, that would be a sleeper hit because they weren't expecting it. That's why they dumped it at the end of August. They didn't care about it. So dump month, a month or months out of the year that aren't deemed to bring in as much revenue. So studios dump their movies that they don't have as much faith in during those times. January to February, end of August to September are usually considered dump months. Theatrical window. It's a period of time a film stays in theaters. The new cap seems to be around 45 days where it was around 75 days before 2020 for like the max. Yeah, I was going to say, wasn't it like two months, two and a half, two to three months? In theater? No, not yeah, three months. for like the big films, they'd stay in theaters all summer or they'd stay in, th stay in theaters from all December through January and February. And the reason why that got shorter too is because of the streaming services. So we saw earlier theaters start getting more money the longer it stays in the theaters. And so now companies are just like, well, maybe it's even more lucrative if we just take it out of theaters and put it on our streaming service because leaving it in there 30 extra days, we're only making 30% of the revenue from any ticket sales at that point. I do wonder though, now that it's starting to like, people are going to the theater again and things are normalizing if the holiday season we will still have movies that stay in theaters all holiday season because that is a huge thing the end of year movies tend to stay in theaters a little bit longer um it's summer and and, and holiday season that do that so i am curious to see if if that changes or not because for example dr strange has been um doing relatively well but that's because there's you know the thing we discussed last week but also i'm curious to see if these if these companies will still want to try to keep it in theaters as like a buzz thing just for like oh these are movies that a lot of people go to theaters to see so we are going to keep them in theaters longer or if it's going to do the streaming service thing instead. I think for the um, for the award season, they're definitely going to try to keep it in theaters to do the same thing because that's just how the award season works. If the award <laughs> season starts shifting to giving a bunch of awards instead out to streaming service movies, which they do somewhat, but not as much as um, to theaters, to theater movies. So I think if that starts to shift even more, then yeah, I feel like they would start seeing them just be like, oh, screw the whole theaters. Screw the holiday season. Let's just have it there for a month and then mm. bring it onto our streaming service. You know, I do think going. that there's also the habit of that people think about with summer and holiday season of it's, it's an event to go to the theater. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, maybe some films would stay longer just because of the event of it all. But maybe yeah. you're right. It could just depend on how they want to do it. But like, I don't know. We'll see. With I feel like with the shift more and more going towards streaming, if the award season and everything else starts going towards it too, 
we might start seeing a shift even more so going towards streaming than uh, we are right now. But I'm, I'm not sure. I know a lot of big studios, sometimes they don't care. Like, again, they don't care as much about money when it comes to January, February, um, even with their biggest films, because at that point, they're not making as much money from the theaters because the theater is getting a much larger chunk of the of the revenue. They're just trying to keep it out as long as they can so that it's in everybody's mind for award season because they want that award. So it's costing them more on the back end. And more people um, see it on streaming, especially around if they're looking for awards and, and more people to know it than than in theaters, I suppose. But yeah, sorry to, to take up the time. I was just curious about that. No, it's fine. But yeah, I just think, I think it just depends on uh, how this keeps going, especially with like Netflix and stuff starting to realize that, you know, putting this much money into the streaming is kind of not, you can't keep doing it for too long. At least not at this least, much. At least like recently jumping. they they had a, they dropped a lot in their uh, stock price because of this. So. Oh, we'll I should probably share happens. that video in the WhatsApp group. Um, it's very interesting, the one about Netflix and streaming services. I will sometime this week. All right. Um, box office hit or box office smash generally mean the same thing. It's just a successful movie, whereas a smash hit just means a very successful movie, like we said earlier. Um, and then blockbuster could also mean greatly, a great commercially successful film. Does anybody else have any... Uh, terms for like theater distribution, um, theatrical titles given to movies and things like that when they come out or any of that kind of thing. All right, so last thing we are talking about, let's try to wrap this up as quickly as possible, but last thing we're talking about is single cam. <clears throat> versus multi-cam and this can be either for film or for tv talk a little bit about both so this comes from abel Sinna, abel Sinna from letter a in multi-cam and that so single camera versus multi-camera shooting with rubidium he says doing single camera and multi-camera setups have pros and cons this could be for TV or film for narrative works. He said they have, they found that for lighting setup, for them, lighting setup, it was about the same amount of time that, um, that they did on both. Just with multicam, they're setting up all of the lighting at the beginning. Whereas for single cam, they're setting it up shot for shot. They do one shot and they switch it around and they move the lights, they do the next shot. And then they set up for the next shot as they go. But the overall lighting setup time for them ended up being about the same overall. It's just for multicam, you're doing it all at the beginning, getting it all ready, and then you're shooting all the way through. And single cam, you are setting it up for each shot, each angle. So you're switching around the lights a little bit with, uh, after each shot is complete. If you're able to have a pre-set up, if you're able to pre-set up or do pre-rigging at the location, multi-cam would be better because even though it takes longer at the start, you'd be able to do it a day in advance if you are able to have the location for multiple days. So then you could go there and everything's already ready to go when the actors arrive the next day. Multi-cam is more expensive if you don't already have the gear because you're going to need more cameras, more tripods, more lenses, monitors, and cables. And also you need multiple camera crews there all at the same time. So it can be a lot more expensive to have all of that equipment and extra people around. Also with multi-cam, you're, you're often not able to get as close with the lights, the sound, and sometimes even the camera because you're always at risk of getting other lights, cameras, and stands in the shot. You typically have less control over the look since you're lighting for multiple angles and not for one individual shot. With lights, because you can't get them as close, you need larger lights for the same amount of softness you'd get from a smaller light closer to the subject with a single camera setup. 
for speed, multi-cam wins. If you get a good take or a good performance, you'll have all of the angles of that shot. And so then you're good to go to the next, um, the next scene or the next take or whatever the next line is because you already captured it from all angles. Whereas single camera, you have to go over and over and have the actor do it over and over again. And they might not do it as well as they did that time where you might have to do multiple takes from the new angle until they do it a, a good take again. With continuity, it'll, uh, with multicam, it'll cut easier since all of the angles are shot at once in the same time. It can literally flow from one to the next. You don't have to worry about it matching up with their shirt moving around a different way or them being in a different position like you might have to do with single cam because they're not exactly shot at the same time. Even though they might try to do the same movements, they might not be in the same position at the same moment when they are delivering their performance. With multicam, it can be harder to direct since you can only ever pay attention to one monitor or one performance at a time. You can sort of try to do both, but it's better to pay attention to one over the other. And so you're gonna be paying attention to one actor more than the other. However, multicam can help to capture authentic reactions if you are actually scaring someone or showing them something for the first time to get a real reaction. Any improv might also be easier to capture with multicams so the movements line up because improv, they're gonna be saying and doing different things. And so it might not line up as well if you're trying to chop it together. Explosions, stunts, sometimes with child actors or animals, it is usually better to have multicam setups for those moments as well. Or if you're on a timeline, like maybe you have, you're trying to shoot during magic hour or golden hour when the sun is rising or the sun is setting and you need to capture those moments fast before the light changes. Multicam, you'll have a lot more footage to sort through and you'll have a lot more footage shot at once so that you are capturing those moments and you don't need to worry about the light changing by the time you get the shots you want with one angle and moving to the next. With multicam, you will also have a lot more footage to sort through in post-production most of the time. And that can be good if you have the time for it, or it can be bad if you're on a time crunch in post-production because you have a lot more stuff to sort through. You have a lot more time you have to dedicate to that. This uh, next stuff comes from nofilmschool.com. So for TV, single camera shows and scripts are much like single camera film and the way you write a film script. For scripts on multicam shows, they are often formatted very differently. So sometimes on a multicam, first of all, let me show the, so this is a Barry, the TV show Barry, and this shows like the script for a single camera show. It's very similar to what you might see in a um, feature film. The, everything is kind of very similar to how you do it in a feature film where it doesn't have very many differences. However, in a multi-cam shoot, this is from Friends. You'll have the formatting be a little bit different Sometimes the name of each character will be in parentheses directly below the scene heading. So sometimes, um, depending on the show, they'll be like which characters are in right underneath the scene heading or the slug line. All the action and description is in all caps. You can even see that right here. So unlike a feature film, a multi-cam script is going to have all caps in their description. Character names are underlined when they are first introduced. Unlike feature film and single camera shows, then you just capitalize their name. But since everything is capitalized in the description, you have to underline it to make it stand out. Character entrances and exits are often underlined as well as physical transitions. Like if they walk to the other side, walk would be underlined. Major or important sounds are often underscored and set off with a colon, like sound, colon, door slams. 
dialogue is often double spaced. So it can take up a lot more pages um, if you have a lot of dialogue in your scene. Parentheticals are more common than they are in single camera and feature screenplays. You can even see that right here. Underneath Joey, it says to Monica. Right above that, Phoebe, off their looks. There's a lot of different parentheticals that's saying exactly what is happening with that dialogue. And in feature film or single camera TV shows, they usually tell you, try to avoid those as much as possible. So it's uh, quite different in that aspect. Also the parentheticals in a multi-cam script don't have to be on a separate line and they are often in line with the dialogue. You can even see that right here and right there, where in a, a single camera script, if they had it, it would be right above the dialogue, right underneath the person's name. I don't know if this has any, but, oh, there you go. Into cell, hello. So Barry, into cell, hello. And you see like it's on a separate line. And then you see these, this dialogue's double spaced. There's a space in between each part and the parentheticals are right next to it or right in the middle. The page header will often include the scene and act numbers below the page. This one doesn't, but some of them will have it like where the page number is. Right underneath that, it'll say scene, scene two, act one, or act three, act six, however many acts are in this. Acts all begin on a new page and start with all caps centered, the act number written around one third of the way down the page. So I don't know if this actually has one, but if it did, it would basically have, you'd have like the third of the page all blank about right to there. And then you just have act one or act two in the middle. Acts end with a centered capital E-N-D, end of act, number whatever, number two, number one. The end of the episode is indicated with underlined and the right fade out. So at the end of the episode, it usually has fade out, underlined to the right like that. And that's it for like the script structural structural differences. So if you have a 22 minute script or a 20 or a 30 minute script for a multi-cam setup, you're going to end up with like 59 or 60 pages um, because of how the dialogue and how everything is spread out. So it's I not wonder, a, it's not a one-to-one -one like it is with single, where these on a single, it's actually um, made to try to match, like this page should match about a minute when it's converted to the actual footage. And this one, it's not as much. It's, it's more maybe, maybe not. And that's why it's like 59 pages for 22 minutes of, of stuff. This is uh, what I heard is multicam is set up more like a theater play. So it's written more like a theater, um, a theater play. Is it still called a screenplay? No. What do you call a theater play? Um, it's written. A, uh... Wait, you're talking just about a play? No, I, I mean, I don't know. Screenplay, but not screenplay. Are you talking Either way, it's written more like a, like you would handle a play, like a playwright. Um, whereas a single camera a is set production. up more like a film. What? A theater production? I'm talking about the script. Oh. Um, I think it's still called a script what is it called there is a specific name i forget now either way a multi-cam tv show is, is just structurally different for various reasons because it is set up more like a play you have like that the multi multiple cameras around and it's all kind of almost live but it's not so and are you timing the cameras on each character because if they change their line and their line turns out to be longer or shorter does that affect it at all the script or the the cameras the camera move setup because I know you switch from one camera to the other, but you just do that in post, right? You look at all the footage and then right. Okay. Because I I, I was 
Just some shows, I think even Brian pointed this out, some shows it depends, but they'll have a control room where they have all of the monitors of the different takes. And sometimes depending on the show, um, I'm not sure, I don't think it's used as often in narrative projects, but they actually do like a pre-edit in there where they're picking through this, oh, do that, do that. Can yeah, I remember in the behind the scenes. And then they go in and they re-edit it to uh, fit it to whatever they're trying to do. So yeah. sometimes we'll do that. To I was just thinking it. about that because just skimming the script, you can see how many lines are actually changed. Um, it's crazy. There are actually quite a few that I that I found just skimming. So I wondered like, oh, if they're on there for longer or shorter. Oh, I guess yeah, in, in this sure. case, it wouldn't make a difference because um, from what we saw of their setup, they just... What, um, looked at the different shots and editing so it'd be different as opposed mm. to having to switch switch that camera switch this camera right because oftentimes in friends anyway they were doing it on set because they had a live audience so if they didn't react well to this joke then they would just rewrite it on set so they wouldn't go back and like re reformat anything they would just kind of scratch it out and rewrite it Enough. but yeah you can see like how many parentheticals are used like two ross had enough, enjoying this. So it explains how they are doing it, um, you know, what, how they are saying it. Whereas a film, you have a lot more interpretation given to the actor and the director to figure out how they want to go about saying this line. On a multi-cam one, they, they kind of just tell them, do it like this, you know, it's, you've yeah, had I would enough. I imagine the genre it. also plays a part in it. What? Uh, yeah i would imagine the genre also plays a part in it like a sitcom or like a something a little more like that would be there would be a lot more parentheticals and a lot more of a description as opposed to a drama maybe where yeah i don't know how many dramas do multi-cam setups well that's the other thing so multi-cam setups are often used for sitcoms um because those don't have to be as as realistic feeling whereas the single cam can really isolate a performance isolate an actor and a moment and can hang on to it for as long as they want multi-cam has Just to kind of like the they're doing it live but it's recorded so it is kind of in the way of like a theater so it doesn't feel as real it feels like you're watching a show more than you would um from watching a single camera no, that. yeah, I was referring to the parentheticals in the script, the amount of parentheticals in the script. Oh, gotcha, yeah. yeah. I'm not saying these parentheticals are there for multi-cam setups. Oh, okay. Multi-cam script. So if it's a, if it's a drama, uh, I don't know. I don't know. There probably is, but I don't know any dramas that do multi-cam. I was just curious. Off the top of my head, anyway. Anyway, there's a few sources that agreed that an actor's performance is usually better in single camera setups because... They don't have to constantly be on and also because the director can give more specific instructions and feedback to each actor to really nail down the performance they're going for. And also because when the actor knows that it's the camera's only on them, um, a lot of the directors were saying they, they, they tend to put in more effort than they do when it's just like they're always being filmed. And I was like, oh, now it's my moment, you know, like when it's only oh, on them. Oh, really? I find that like, you know, on professional sets, like with like the actors and stuff, I think it shouldn't matter if there's two cams, it should still do a good job regardless. But I mean, that's just my thing. Oh yeah, but it's just like a, it's not on purpose. They don't like half do it. They just, they instinctually, just subconsciously, they just yeah. trigger like, oh, I gotta, I gotta do it. You know, if the camera's on me, this is my time to shine. I was I was going to say, I just it's looked not it like up on purpose, and I feel, but... yeah, okay. I, I just looked it up and I feel like sitcoms are, I mean, multicam is probably more of a sitcom thing because I didn't see any multicam dramas, at least yeah. that, from the quick research I did. Because I don't, I feel like the drama would be a lot harder to capture yeah. consistently in a uh, multicam kind of setup. I see lots yeah. of multicam setups. But yeah, so on um, on sitcoms and things like that, in movies they use multicam, but for certain things they don't always use them. And single camera TV shows are set up a lot more in the way that a um, both in production and in the script, the setup of a single camera show is much like a film, whereas multicam is much more like theater. 
um, in the script and in the production. Multicam, you need more money to have more cameras, um, but you can shoot the scene faster. So if you're on a deadline or if you have only a few hours to be in a certain location, it's better if you can get multiple cameras to try to knock out the scene as quickly as possible. So you don't have to shoot Monica's angle and then go over and shoot Chandler and then shoot Joey and redo the lighting each time because that all is gonna take a lot of time. It can also help with the actors for Multicam. If you can set up the day before, they're not gonna wait on lighting at all. So they can jump right in and start doing their scene. And then they just have to wait for the next scene to be lit. Yeah, um, and we just we just use Friends as a reference because it's a show that almost everyone knows and it's a lot easier to explain. I realized I used it a bunch, but I was yeah. like, oh, well, these, all these, all the sources I was getting was using it anyway. So it's just easier to explain that way. Because it's a show that's like very well known and almost everyone knows it. So it's a lot easier to reference it. Right. But yeah, does anyone have any questions, comments, anything to add to multicam versus single cam? Um, not too much at this point. I mean, it's just more of like the more you do it, the more you get a feel of it. So. Like All right, cool. Use, so, single and double, yeah. last thing I'm going to say is um, Thursday, we're going to be talking about set designers, set decorators, TV pilots, and pilot season, and what that means, and web series. So, we'll, oh, that's when we're talking about web series. So, yeah, we'll get into web series, and like that's kind of like the cheaper way to do a TV show or TV pilots, writing a pilot, pitching it to a network or making a web series and trying to pitch it to a media company or to a network as a pilot. Um, we'll talk about all that on Thursday. Sounds good. All right, thanks everybody. Night guys. Awesome. All right, good night. Nice to see you. Have a great night. See you guys uh, Thursday. Good night everybody. <laughs>